Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Through Time and Clades. My name is Albert. I'm Joan. And uh, we are back with a new uh, annual update special uh, for our series Dinosaurs, the Second Chapter, where we talk about uh, the diversity and evolution of modern birds. So primarily focusing on their evolutionary biology and fossil record. So there have certainly been a lot of exciting uh, studies on bird paleontology and evolution since the last time we did an update special for this series. Um, but before we dive into Lowe's, how have you been doing since the last time we chatted? Pretty fine. I'm just preparing for the usual December holidays. Mm -hmm. um, you know, hanging out with folks, expecting people to come by and just have a good time. Uh, I've been kind of on an interesting little reading journey as of like recent times. Um, I started reading Richard Forte's Life. Natural history of the first four billion years of life on Earth, which is a bit of a vintage book at this point because it came out in 1997. Um, and I'm kind of late to the party, I understand, because you know, Richard Forte is one of those paleontologists that's written extensively and it seems like everybody knows who they are. Mm -hmm. Um, and I've had this book, you know, lying around for a while, waiting for the right time to read it. Um, and I finally I finally got the itch. I sat down and started it, and I'm already 100 pages in, which should tell you immediately <laughs> that I've really been enjoying it. it it's, um, I mean, Forte is an amazing writer, and I, I always like, even if a book is really old, I, I can still get like insights here and there mm -hmm. from it. Um, like two things that really stood out to me recently was the fact that apparently we have a hundred meter stromatolite fossils mm. <laughs> and i have had trouble grasping even 10 meter ones <laughs> so <laughs> i'm only imagining what these things must look like in person yeah um why don't you explain what stromatolites are <laughs> well right right so um stromatolites are so they're colonies of cyanobacteria mm -hmm. that over time they form like a layer like a mat and this is supported by a, a bacterial communities underneath. And over time, as the cyanobacteria die and reproduce, they kind of stack themselves on top of each other. Yeah. Um, until eventually you get these like column or cone-like structures. I guess it depends on the species. Um, and these, they're still around today, um, but they usually flourish in communities where there are no grazing organisms. Mm -hmm. So, you know, cy cyanobacteria, you know, they, they form these mats. And usually when you find bacterial mats, there are like mollusks and worms and things that will go and, and scrape them up and eat them. But these existed like way before, you know, eukaryotic life, multicellular life was around on the planet. And in an age when there were no grazing animals or other organisms to begin with, these things could kind of just grow unimpeded. Hence, the fact that we have 10 and 100 meter specimens of these. Whereas today, like the few communities that exist where the water, you know, is very low in diversity and there are no grazing organisms, you can still find some of these. But I mean, they're, they're pennies compared to what they used to be in the past. Mm. Um, and they're just fascinating organisms. And I was familiar with stromatolite fossils. Um, I just didn't know that they could be so big. Which I mean, you know, I guess time flies when you're not having to worry about grazers. <laughs> there are probably bigger ones than that that um, we just haven't found yet or have been lost with time. Um, so that was one like insight that I found. Another one that was really interesting to learn. So there's a concept in biology and I guess astrobiology too um, called panspermia, which is this idea that life on Earth was seeded from space. And usually it's seeded from like, you know, bolide impacts, like a comet, whether it had the compounds to create life or it had organisms on it already launched into the earth and subsequently established a presence there for, you know, biological organisms. Um, I did not realize that there was also a, oh, what's, what's a polite word to use? Um, there was an interesting like subtext and legacy with authors who have tried to push the panspermia model. 
as the uh, origin of life on it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, so like there's the most recent iterations of panspermia have argued that the universe is in a steady state model, you know, which kind of goes against what we know now about Big Bang cosmology. And that not only that, you know, life was seeded from comets, it was regularly impacted and wiped out by comets. And not like in a, you know, not just in like a KPG instance, but like comets were full of like viruses that would rain down upon the earth and cause mass extinctions on periodic levels. Um, or just like general catastrophes in, in turn, um, which there really is no evidence of that sort of thing. Um, and just all kinds of kind of cranky ideas like that. And uh, it's it's very weird how things overlap mm-hmm. because apparently a lot of the proponents of the panspermia model of this sort have also tried to like make claims about the evolution of organisms on the earth. Like apparently one of the one of the um, authors behind this tried to argue that Archaeopteryx was a forgery. Yeah. Because birds were supposed to have evolved after the dinosaurs, which were supposed to have died from a comet raining down viruses. Um, so yeah, there's a there's a whole lot to unpack with this sort of stuff. Um, but again, I never would have really learn about this stuff right away had I not read it from Richard Forte's book. Um, So uh, I've certainly been enjoying myself. It's really wonderfully read and it's very dense Mm -hmm. in its coverage, Um, but without being like overbearing, like everything fits together and it's, it's quite nice. Um, So yeah, even for an old book, I I highly recommend it if you Mm -hmm. haven't checked it out yet. If you're interested in how depictions and coverage of the history of life have changed over time get a look at the state of paleontology in the late 90s. Mm-hmm. So, so I'm very interested to see how that goes from there. <laughs> Is that one that you've uh, read or have you seen any of Richard Forte's books at all? Uh, I have not read that one actually. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I'm familiar with him and his work, but uh, no, I, I, that, I, have, I have not read that one myself, but uh, I, I agree there, there's um, often a lot to be gained from reading, you know, relatively old literature. Um, and uh, that definitely sounds like a good one to check out. <laughs> so how about you? How have you been? Kind of similarly, I've also been quite busy preparing for the upcoming holidays, uh, mostly trying to get a lot of stuff done before the holidays themselves arrive. Um, but uh, I would say it's going overall pretty well. Um, I would say my biggest update in terms of relevance to the show is that a few weeks ago, I attended TetsuCon. Um, which is a zoological convention, uh, pretty much the only one of its kind, really. Um, it is run by our friend Darren Nash. Uh, take a drink if you're doing the drinking game. Um, and uh, he is a British paleontologist um, who runs a popular blog, Tetrapod Zoology. His main specialty is in Mesozoic dinosaurs and other Mesozoic reptiles, but uh, he has a terrifying knowledge of all kinds of um animals, especially tetrapod animals, which are the four-limbed vertebrates. And um, in recent years, uh, in fact, this is the 10th year that there has been a TetsuCon, uh, the community surrounding the Tetrapod Zoology blog has basically grown big enough that he has been able to run this uh, annual convention, which is incredibly fun. Um, And so in some ways, it is similar to a conference but it is it is also not quite like a conference um so like a conference a lot of the events are talks given by um researchers who study various different types of tetrapod animals um but the audience is not composed solely of academic researchers and in fact the speakers are often not you know solely academic researchers but a lot of time are uh, people who might have a different day job and are just interested in this subject, or in some cases they are people such as uh, science communicators or artists or um, uh, simply people who have, for some reason or another, worked a lot with certain types of animals. For example, one year we had a falconer come and give a talk, for example. Um, And in in any case, uh, it's a pretty diverse bunch. And similarly to an actual convention and less like an academic conference, there are 
like stalls set up for artists and uh, other people who might have produced uh, relevant types of merchandise to come and set up and show off their their wares and people can purchase things from them or, or get get their things signed um and uh, it's a it's really fun it's a it's a unique experience i would say there, there's really no other kind of event quite like it um and uh, this year uh, there was a major theme of marine reptiles because darren uh, earlier in the year just had a book, a popular book on marine reptiles published. It's called, uh, I think, Ancient Sea Reptiles. Um, you can get it from major retailers. And uh, it, it's a, you know, as far as I've seen, I have a copy myself, although I haven't read it from cover to cover yet. Um, but, you know, knowing Darren's track record, it, it is a really excellent introduction to the topic of extinct marine reptiles. And it's essentially, I mean, there there have been books on this produced in the past, but um, I would say obviously this is the most recent one and probably going to be the lead go-to if you want to know all about extinct marine reptiles, especially if you're not a specialist. Um, but in any case, be because uh, of the publication of this book, um, Darren invited a lot of speakers who have worked on marine reptiles to come and speak this year, um, including uh, Luke Muscat, who has worked on like the locomotion of the extinct plesiosaur uh, marine reptiles, um, which swam using two pairs of flippers in a way that is not seen in any living group of animals. And to study the biomechanics of this group of reptiles, he even had like a robot plesiosaur boat uh, to try and figure out how the hydrodynamics would work. And so he brought that along to show it off to us, which is really cool. Um, but uh, there, there weren't only marine reptile um, events uh, this year. There were, of course, other types of um, uh, talks as well. Uh, I, I, of course, was looking forward most to the bird talks. And there were two bird talks this year, and they were both really excellent. Uh, one by uh, Jennifer Campbell-Smith on studying corvids, so you know, the crows and their relatives, and especially how corvids learn things. Corvids are very smart types of birds, that we, as we've talked before on the, on the show. And so there are all kinds of interesting uh, experiences and challenges that you have to go through when you're studying corvids. Um, and the other talk was by Todd Green on cassowaries. Uh, Todd's research is basically all about cassowaries, uh, especially on things like the function of the weird kind of crest that cassowaries have, um, uh, also called a cask. And... Um, he basically gave an overview of how he got into cassowaries as well as uh, what his research has um, found about cassowaries uh, over the years, which is also really engaging. And he also mentioned that he was um, he's in the middle of producing a documentary on cassowaries, which is really cool. Um, and in fact, is looking for crowdfunding support. So um, I'll try to remember to put a link to um, Todd's cassowary um, documentary fundraiser uh, in the link um, in the description below. Um, and Darren is actually also involved with the production of that documentary. And speaking of documentaries, uh, Darren also hosted a session where he talked about Prehistoric Planet. We've mentioned it before on the show, a recent uh, BBC and Apple production. It's a documentary style series uh, looking at animals from the end of the late Cretaceous, uh, basically formatted as low a documentary crew actually traveled back in time to film these animals in the wild. Um, and it is just incredible, like both the visual effects and the science in that series are, you know, just amazing. <laughs> like they, they, they really took into account like a lot of detail um, uh, when it comes to like our current understanding of life at the end of the uh, Cretaceous period. Um, very much worth watching. And Darren was the lead consultant on this show. And so he shared with us a lot of um, interesting information about the production of the series. Um, specifically, we looked at a, a specific um, episode of the series, and he shared some background information on how, how they made the series and um, what the work that went into it. Um, however, he did request that um, those of us who were at that event not, not to share um, the details of what he said, and so I'm not going to do so here, but it was a lot of fun and very insightful. And probably the big, kind of most popular event of this year's TetsuCon was that um, Darren invited Nigel Marvin uh, to come give a talk. And uh, I would imagine that a lot of people, especially those who are around our age, are familiar with Nigel Marvin from the fact that he was the presenter and host of several documentaries um, on prehistoric life. So the, these are the, uh, like, sea monsters and... Uh, 
uh, chased by dinosaurs, and uh, with ITV was a series prehistoric park. Uh, so basically, the the idea was that Nigel would be um, traveling back in time to interact with these extinct animals, and the you know it, the, those are a pretty fun series. Um, now. Although in the paleo community, Nigel was probably best known for Lowe's particular works, um, he had, had in fact had a very long career of uh, presenting documentaries on modern animals as well. In fact, that, that was the reason he was brought on to do these extinct animals was, uh, or extinct animal series was because um, he had this experience, you know, going out into the wild, interacting with living animals and showing them to a, a, an audience. Um, and so his talk was basically about um, like, you know, some fun or, or, or some, you know, interesting events that, that he's run into uh, while filming for documentaries on extinct animals, on modern animals, and also his interactions with uh, other humans as well, which can also be quite interesting. Uh, but it, it was a really fun talk. You know, I, I've never seen Nigel Marvin, you know, speak in person, and uh, it, it, it was a a really fantastic time, I would say. Um, and every year, TetsuCon also has an infamously difficult quiz where Darren comes up with various questions, mostly relating to um, tetrapod zoology. Um, uh, although in, in some cases, like he also ties in questions about like movies he likes, for example. But um, in, in any case, a score of like six or so would be doing pretty well if you're not like a zoology nerd. Um, and that that's six out of 30 questions, basically. Um, now, every year since I've started attending TetsuCon, I've always placed top three um, in the in the quiz. I, I imagine one of these years I, I won't, but this year was not that year. I placed second in the quiz this year, um, and so I got a prize. So that was fun. And so I managed to get a um, plush polacanthus, which is a kind of um, ankylosaur that's been found uh, in Britain. And that was made by Rebecca Groom, Rebecca Groom of Paleo Plushies fame, um, which was really nice. Uh, but uh, those, I would say, were the highlights of this year's TetsuCon, um, and probably like the, the big event that I was at uh, between you know the last time we recorded an episode and now. Um, so yeah, that was a that was a pretty long kind of rambling intro about what I've been up to, um, but. Um, you know, do, do you have anything to add before we jump into the stories? Well, um, I was fortunate to attend uh, the digital version of TetZooCon, uh, TetZoomCon back in the COVID days, That's right. the early COVID days. Um, and uh, that itself was, you know, a lot of fun and a very engaging experience. I have not had the fortune to attend a live TetZooCon yet, but I could only imagine <laughs> how much fun it would have been in person. Just to be kind of surrounded by, you know, like-minded uh, natural history nerds, and you know, learning about, you know, the wonders of of weird tetrapods and cryptids, and you know, the goings on in paleo pop culture. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm really happy that you enjoyed yourself and, and had a really good time. And uh, I, I understand it; it's been getting bigger and bigger and bigger with each successive year. Mm -hmm. So who knows where we'll be in five years. Maybe it'll be like a Comic-Con <laughs> level event, which wouldn't that be something? Uh, hey, yes, it would. Yeah, and you're right. Uh, TetsuCon keeps growing every year, and this year was the biggest one yet. Uh, from what I've heard, I think over 200 people attended. Um, so yeah, that's uh, it's getting big. <laughs> with that said, um, shall we move on to the updates? Sounds exciting. Let's do it. <laughs> Alrighty. So we're going to talk about what happened in the world of bird paleontology and evolutionary biology since the last time we uh, did an update for Dinosaurs, the second chapter. Um, of course, this is going to be a selection of highlights. I can't possibly cover absolutely every single study that is relevant <laughs> to this subject. But um, yeah, uh, let's have a look at um, some of these um, noteworthy stories. So, um, as per usual, we'll, we'll go episode by episode, uh, depending on the relevance of the, of the stories. Uh, we will start off with the paleonates. Um, so, of course, uh, the paleonates, um, the ostrich-like birds and their kin, uh, they were not technically the first episode of Dinosaurs, the second chapter, which was more about like um, the origins and kind of evolution leading up to modern birds in general. Now, last year, there, there weren't too many kind of 
super big scale studies on on that topic. Uh, so we're we're gonna dive right into the more specific uh, bird groups, and we'll start, of course, with the paleonates, which were the subject of the second episode. Um, and so in the world of paleonates, uh, we've had a new study on paleonate phylogeny. Uh, I talked quite a bit about paleonate phylogeny, both in the episode itself and and in subsequent updates. Uh, and basically, paleonate phylogeny is very difficult to figure out. Um, so uh, this new study uh, basically reinforces that. Uh, what it did was that it looked at uh, different methods of analyzing um, uh, paleonate genetics. Um, so th this was like a, a study on uh, you know the interrelationships of living paleonates, living and recently extinct ones, um, for which we have genetic material, and uh, basically looked at different methods of analyzing these genes, as well as analyzing specific types of genes. And they found, uh, or the author found, that essentially there is a lot of difference uh, or a lot of conflict um, between you know, different methods or different genes, like depending on how you analyze them. Uh, you can get different results when it comes to paleonate phylogeny. However, um, as I kind of discussed in the last update special, um, some ways of analyzing um, genetic data under certain circumstances um, we know are more likely to produce erroneous results um, than others. And so um, in the end, um, after running a bunch of different analyses on these genetic data sets, the author concluded that the um, particular phylogeny that is seen here um, is probably the best supported paleonate phylogeny. Um, so we have the ostriches being the most distantly related to all the rest. That part, like, we pretty much already agreed on. Um, but the next part is the kind of, like, where the tricky part was, which was how do the remaining paleonate groups relate to each other? And um, so some studies have suggested that the rias are the next most distant to the rest. Um, other studies have suggested that the uh, Tinamu and Moa group are the next most distant. Um, this study favors the idea that Rias um, are the next most distant um, after the ostriches. And so uh, I, I already discussed in the last update special that there was a previous study um, that came out like you know, the previous year that uh, favored this result as well. And so um, I would say that even though paleonate phylogeny has proven very difficult for us to figure out, um, tentatively I would favor this topology as well, as I show on the next slide. And so um, if I were to make dinosaurs second chapter all over again, um, then th this would probably be the phylogeny I would go with. Um, but yeah, I think it's good to have these studies that basically uh, kind of uh, look into why these you know, challenging uh, problems are so challenging and then uh, see if we can actually come up with a conclusion to uh, what is, despite it all, the best supported of all the different options. Yeah, that's uh, that's pretty much all I have to say about this study. Um, let's go on to the next slide. Um, so in this one, we're going to look at a fossil paleonate this time. Um, so this was a study on a specimen, a fossil specimen from the late Pleistocene of China uh, that appeared to be the uh, femur, so the thigh bone, of a big ostrich, bigger than living ostriches. Now the problem is this specimen has been lost, so nobody knows where it is or e if it even still exists. Um, but fortunately, uh, the author of this study reported that he had found a cast that was made of the specimen. Um, so basically a replica of the specimen. By restudying this cast, um, the author was able to identify various um, you know, anatomical features to see how it was actually related to modern ostriches. And what he found was that uh, this specimen shares uh, certain features with the genus Pachystruthio, which we talked about in the original version of this um, of this series and of this episode, even um, so, Pachystruthio appears to have been a stem ostrich. So it was, you know, related to to modern ostriches, but not not an actual modern ostrich, which are members of the genus Struthio. Um, the Pachystruthio previously uh, was known from the early Pleistocene of Eurasia, and it would have been among one of the biggest birds uh, of all time. Um, so the largest specimens of Pachystruthio are a lot bigger than the modern um, ostriches. Um, the late Pleistocene Pachystruthio, this um, kind of lost specimen um, from China, 
if it is a member of Pachystruthio, it would be the youngest known member of Pachystruthio, though showing that Pachystruthio has survived into the late Pleistocene and not just uh, the early Pleistocene. Um, it was not as big as the biggest members of this genus, uh, but using this femur, the author was able to estimate that it was probably over 250 kilograms, which is still substantially bigger than the modern uh, ostrich. Um, now, there's a question of what species to assign this femur to, um, because the name uh, Struthio andersoni has been used for ostriches that have been found in the late Pleistocene of China. And in fact, that is the name that the author used in this paper, uh, of course, since he considers the specimen to be a member of Pachystruthio and not the modern Struthio, um, the genus would be changed to Pachystruthio andersoni. Um, but there's a problem here, which, which is the fact that the species Struthio andersoni was originally named based on uh, eggshells of ostriches that were found in this region, um, this time and place. It, it is reasonable to suppose that these eggshells belong to whatever ostrich uh, was in this region, which would be, you know, this Pachystruthio, um, like assuming that genus assignment is correct. However, the taxonomy of eggshells versus body fossils is kind of tricky because you often can't know for sure whether or not the remains of certain eggs actually belong to, you know, certain organisms that are represented only by body fossils, right? Um, and so as a result of this, there are actually parallel taxonomies for eggshell fossils versus body fossils. And so normally we would not assign like body fossils to the same species as eggshell fossils um e even like th this goes like even if we have strong reason to suspect that they belong to the same organism so basically the taxonomy of eggshells is going to be basically a completely separate thing from the taxonomy of, of body fossils like e whether or not like we have evidence that they belong to the same um, organism and so I, I think ideally, um, we probably should not be reusing the same species uh, to refer to these body fossils of ostriches um, from the same time and place, even if uh, it is reasonable to suspect that they were produced by these ostriches. Um, and in fact, there was a, a paper from a few years ago that suggested that, you know, we, we should stop calling all these um, um, fossil ostriches based on eggshells because there are several, not just Andersoni. Um, like Struthio, whatever species, but instead use like a, an exclusive genus only for like coined for the eggshells, which would be like Struthio olithus, I think, which which is a, a common suffix used for um, um, kind of egg fossils. Um, so we should be calling these like Struthio olithus um, andersoni, and not not like Struthio andersoni, because Struthio, of course, refers to like you know it was named based on living ostriches, um, which are like represented, of course, by body specimens, we have plenty of those. Um, so yeah, like well, whether this should be called Pachystruthio andersoni, I am not completely convinced just yet. But uh, it, it's, it is nice that we, we now have like, kind of, kind of, in a sense, refound the specimen and been able to confirm um, kind of its comparative anatomy in, in relation to, to the modern ostriches. Um, do you have anything to add about this before we go to the next story? I'll say is I definitely echo that I am happy that this specimen has like kind of been rediscovered in this way. Um, lost fossils always frustrate me. Yeah. Like I, I know that apparently there are like entire dinosaur skeletons that have been like lost under the ocean or something like that. Um, right. From right. France. Yeah. And I'm just like, oh my gosh, what if that was like the one that was like right. really important? It's gonna change everything, and then it's just like it's it's sunken treasure at this point. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so we're still with paleonates at this point, uh, but we're going to talk about a different group now. Uh, these are the elephant birds, which are a recently extinct group of paleonates uh, that lived on Madagascar, and they included like some of the biggest birds of all time. And um, indeed, they they would be contenders for like the absolute biggest birds um, to have ever lived. Um, and so this study was uh, a study on um, ancient DNA. So they were able to extract the you know, genetic material uh, from the eggshells of these ele elephant birds because egg, um, elephant birds are 
very well known from eggshell specimens. Um, they're, they laid, like, as far as we know, the largest eggs of um, any animal. Um, and they had very thick, very durable eggshells. And so there are tons of eggshells known from uh, Madagascar that were uh, produced by elephant birds. And um, elephant birds lived in the tropics. So a lot of the time in the tropics are not a great environment for DNA to preserve because it degrades uh, more quickly in those hot and humid environments. Um, but uh, people have had more luck getting elephant bird DNA out of eggshells and out of their bones. Um, and so this study was able to uh, kind of sample a ton of elephant bird eggshells to try and figure out more um, about their evolution. Um, and so when they analyzed um, these elephant bird genetic sequences, um, along with some of the material like that people had gotten out of their bones, uh, relatively fewer, but we, st we still have some, they were able to kind of um, propose basically a new uh, taxonomy for, for elephant birds. Um, so we've known for a long time that there are two like major groups of elephant birds. Like there's, um, and classically they've been considered two different genera basically. So there are the smaller Muller ornis and also the larger Epi ornis. Um, and so this study was able to confirm these two different groups. So Muller ornis and Epi ornis are two different uh, clusters on, on this phylogeny here. And in fact, uh, the authors estimate that they diverged from each other uh, quite a long time ago, in fact. Now, there has been a bit more confusion about the taxonomy of the specimens within uh, EP ornis. Um, like a ton of different species of EP ornis have been named, and it is not entirely clear which ones are valid um, or which ones are just represent like additional individuals of already known species. And in fact, um, a recent study like in the last few years, um, in the 2010s, suggested that uh, there should actually be uh, two genera recognized of the large elephant birds. Uh, so not just Epiornis, but a new one that they named Verambe. And the specimens that were assigned to Verambe um, were like the biggest and most robust specimens, um, which would include like some, like the absolute biggest birds ever. Um, but this study, um, where they sampled a bunch of eggshells produced by the big elephant birds, found that there were only um, there was only evidence for essentially two separate species, and uh, the specimens that were assigned to Verambe, um, they suggested, were genetically indistinguishable from specimens assigned to the species Epiornis maximus, um, and so they argue that Verambe should instead be considered the same thing as Epiornis maximus. Um, so what would be upland if this is the case with the fact that the Verambe specimens seem even bigger and more robust than the other Epiornis? Uh, well, we know in some paleonates, um, there's kind of extreme sexual dimorphism. Uh, we talked about this with the moa, for example. Uh, in the moa, um, in some species of moa, especially the really big ones, the um, females were a lot bigger than the males. Um, and so it's possible that this was also going on with Epiornis maximus, where one sex was a lot bigger than the others, and uh, going by the trend seen in other paleonates, uh, probably the females were the ones that were much bigger. Uh, the authors also point out that this is also consistent with the thickness of the eggshells that were laid by, um, you know, in association um, with Epiornis maximus. Um, like these eggshell thicknesses are consistent, or would be consistent with the eggs that were laid by a bird the size of a rombe. Um, so an even bigger bird than the specimens that will, you know, were thought to be uh, separate from Barambe, like that were like regular Epiornis maximus. Um, so it may be that like the smaller Epiornis maximus specimens were, were the males and the Barambe uh, specimens were the females that actually laid the, the eggs. Um, now, because again, this is a question of kind of um, matching egg fossils and body fossils together, right? Um, so like we, we can't know for sure whether we have sampled um, any Verambe, um, you know, eggs in this in this data set. Um, so it may be that if we collected even more eggshells, and we, we might be able to find evidence that there's actually a separate cluster uh, from this time and region um, that would represent like another species of big elephant bird. But so far, there doesn't seem to be much reason to suspect that this is the case because um, they, they sample pretty widely from very different uh, fossil sites where, where these eggs have been found um, and where we know that 
Rombe and Bjornis occurred. So if there is like a secret, you know, lineage of um, Epiornis in this, or Epiornis like bird in this region that is not represented by these eggshells, um, they probably simply weren't kind of preserved in these regions, which is technically possible, but we currently don't have much reason to suspect that that is the case. Um, this is a pretty cool study that gave us some new insight into elephant bird evolution, and it seems to suggest that we need to uh, rethink once again kind of our conceptions of like how many elephant bird species there were. Um, do you have anything to add to this? What I'll just say is I think it's fascinating that we've come to a point where we can kind of parse out the genetic history and distinctions of an animal that is extinct today. Right. Yeah. You know, whereas <laughs> it would probably be a lot easier if you know we had elephant birds to begin with that we could mm. sample like in yeah. the wild, but we have enough evidence that we can do this, I guess, kind of post extinction. Right. So <laughs> I, I think that's really fascinating. Yeah, um, and to, to add to that, like uh, at Ted Zukon this year, there was a talk by um, Yvonne Heckela, um, who studies ancient DNA, uh, m mostly not a bird, she mostly works on uh, crocodilians, um, and she's made some really cool discoveries uh, looking at ancient DNA of crocodilians, but she pointed out that when she was doing her PhD, um, she wanted to look at, like, ancient DNA in Neanderthals, for example, and at the time, you know, her supervisors were like, that's impossible. We'll, we'll never, we'll never get DNA that old, basically. And uh, well, <laughs> we we know how wrong that is now, because uh, there, there's been plenty of ancient DNA research on Neanderthals, um, as you've discussed uh, in your series, Humanity: A Prologue. Um, so it's kind of remarkable how quickly that this field has advanced. And I mean, to be sure, like all these examples of ancient DNA are from things that have died out pretty recently like in term in geologic time and of course in in the case of elephant birds they died on in historical times so um we're, we're still not getting ancient dna yet um or at least not not much of it uh, from like really deep time but uh what we have got so far is still really remarkable and it's given us a ton of insight into the kind of uh, evolution and origins of animals that died out in the not too distant past uh, as we can see here um so yeah i definitely agree with that it's a it's an amazing advance and i'm sure we'll continue to develop uh, these techniques and apply them to even more taxa um, as time goes on um so it's a it's a really good time uh, to be studying uh, in this particular field i would say so moving on to the next slide, um, we're going to go on to episode three, where we talked about uh, Gallo and Sere. So this is a group that includes uh, chicken-like birds and the duck-like birds. Um, and this year, uh, we had some pretty cool um, new finds uh, regarding this group. Um, so first of all, is that we got these new uh, fossil species um, of early members of this group. Now. We have actually talked about these two species on our show, haven't we? Um, in our interview with our friend Meg, as part of their PhD, they worked on kind of helping to describe these two species. Um, and these two are, I would say, you know, as someone who has studied this topic uh, myself, uh, very important. So one of them is Anacronornis from the Paleocene-Eocene boundary of the Western United States. Um, and Anacronornis is known from, from more than just the um, material that is shown here, uh, but I'm showing this particular figure here because it shows a skull, which is very well preserved. You, you do not get fossil bird skulls this well preserved very often, um, but we have much of the rest of the body as well. And in fact, this specimen has been mentioned in the scientific literature for ages, since, since the 1980s. Um, and people have been calling it basically, oh, there's this a screamer like fossil bird from the Western United States. Uh, but up until now, it just has not um, been properly described and named. Um, and if you don't recall, uh, screamers are a group of waterfowl. So they're, they're a group of duck-like birds that are still alive today. Although they don't look a whole lot like ducks. So like um, screamers, uh, in terms of their head at least, look a lot more like chicken-like birds. Uh, but they are more closely related to ducks. Um, and Anacronornis indeed has a quite screamer-like head. Um, 
However, in the analyses that the authors ran for their study, where they described Anachronornis, um, they found that Anachronornis was more likely a stem and seriform, so it's not more closely related to screamers than to ducks, but kind of um, on the lineage that was leading to both of them. And so this is a really cool find because, uh, well, first of all, it's a pretty complete and well-preserved fossil that we can get a lot of information out of um, when it comes to when we want to understand the early evolution of anseriform birds. Um, but it's probably also going to be relevant to this whole question of, like, when did the duck-like beak evolve, which I talked about in the episode. Um, so, of course, screamers do not have a duck-like beak. Um, but it has been suggested that they might have reverted back to like a chicken-like beak from a duck-like ancestor because we have some other kind of early, you know, anseriform-like fossils, uh, things like Presbyornis and Conflicto, that have duck-like beaks. Um, and there's an open question as to whether these duck-like early forms are uh, outside of like the, the screamer and duck group or like if they're more closely related to the ducks instead. Um, so if an Achronornis is a stem and seriform, it might represent a stage where the duck-like bill had not evolved. And it does look a lot like a screamer, so could this support the idea that uh, screamers did not revert back to a chicken-like state and instead they just kind of kept a, a chicken-like beak all along? Um, that's one possibility, but uh, I, I, I have to say that you know, the, the analyses that are run in this study and um, did, did not answer this question conclusively because some of these analyses do still support kind of putting things like Presbyornis and Conflicto outside the modern group. So it may be that, you know, screamers did still revert back to an anachronornis like skull um, during their evolution, but uh, it would be quite a remarkable example of reversal. Um, not that that can't happen because evolution does some pretty weird and convoluted things sometimes. Uh, we know this very well. Um, but in, in any case, uh, Anachronornis is a really, really cool find. Um, and I'm glad that it finally has been given like an actual description and name in the scientific literature. Um, you know, there, there are definitely things that we're really interested in when it comes to Gallo and Syrian evolution that I think Anachronornis will be very valuable and key um, to resolving. Um, in the same paper, they named another new species. Uh, this time it's from the early Eocene of the United Kingdom, uh, specifically southern England. Um, so this is Daniel's Avis. Um, and Daniel's Avis uh, has also been mentioned before in scientific literature, also as like, you know, there are these screamer-like birds from the Eocene of the UK, but yeah, we're, we're not going to talk about them more uh, in this paper. Um, and so fi finally, uh, it, it has also been given a description and a name. Um, Daniel's Avis is not quite as completely known as an Achronornis, but it's still pretty damn good, especially for a bird fossil. And in fact, um, we have multiple specimens that seem to belong to Daniel Zavis, um, and instead of just one, like for an Achronornis. And so we actually have quite a decent amount of material when it comes to um, Daniel Zavis as well. And Daniel Zavis also has some screamer-like features. And in fact, in the, in the paper that named these two, um, the authors also consider it likely that Daniel Zavis was another uh, stem and seriform. That being said, um, this was later called into question by another paper that came out, you know, later in the year uh, by a different team of authors. This other team of authors like re-examined the Daniel Zavis specimens, also reported a few bones that were had not been um, kind of described in the previous paper, um, and they argued that. Yes, Daniel Davis has some anseriform like features, but it's possible that some of these features were like already present in the last common ancestor of all Gallo and Serins, and so they're not really like um, features that are characteristic of anseriforms in general. Um, in fact, they suggest that it is possible that Daniel Davis is actually um, more closely related to the Galliforms, the chicken-like birds, instead. Um, so it might be an early stem Galliform with some like quote-unquote anseriform-like features, or it could be an early stem um, anseriform with galliform-like features. It's hard to tell. Um, but in any case, uh, there is an open question as to what exactly Daniel Zavis is. And personally, um, so I, I haven't looked at these specimens in a lot of detail myself yet, but just from like looking at the descriptions and the figures and kind of comparing them to uh, observations from my own research on like 
Galloan Siren evolution, like looking at modern Galloan Siren as well as early fossil forms. Um, I, I did already notice, like even before this other paper came out, that Daniel Zavis has some features that are not really uh, characteristic of what we'd expect to see in, in early Anserian forms. So I can definitely buy that it might instead belong to like the Galliform stem instead. Um, but of course, further research, as always, is needed to really sort these things out. But I'm, I am really happy that we now have so much new fossil data to work with regarding this part of the tree, and I, I really can't wait to find out what happens when we combine all this new data together with what we already have. I guess we kind of did this when we did the interview, but congrats to Meg for like getting to work on such amazing, cool fossil specimens and for publishing this paper. Um, do you have anything to add to this uh, before we go on? Yes, definitely. Congratulations. These are amazing specimens. Let's see. Uh, moving on to the next slide, um, we're looking at another uh, fossil that has been proposed to be a member of Galloway Siri. Although, as we discussed before on the show, there is an open question regarding that. Um, so, this is a new study on a very interesting fossil bird called Vegavis. Uh, so Vegavis is known from the very end of the Cretaceous um, of Antarctica, and so it is one of the oldest, like, modern bird specimens that is known. Like, it's all the way, like, at the end of the Cretaceous, uh, before the end Cretaceous mass extinction happened. Vegavis is definitely one of the most completely known um, early modern bird specimens that we have. Uh, but we don't have a lot of its skull. Um, however, we do have a little bit from the back of its lower jaw. And if you have a good memory, you might remember that the back of the lower jaw is one of those um, regions of anatomy that seem to characterize the group Gallo and Seri. Like, um, chickens and ducks look pretty different from each other, but they have some similarities in the back of that lower jaw um, that were probably inherited from their last common ancestor and still shows to us today that they are closely related groups. Um, so uh, when Megavis was first described, it was actually described as an early Anseriform. So if Megavis was indeed an Anseriform, we would expect it to have like this characteristic gallo serin jaw. And so this um, new study kind of took a closer look at that. And so what we see here um, are the back of the jaw of several different types of birds. Um, in the top row, you're seeing the back of the jaw seen from the side. Um, so if you're you know, looking at it, the, the side of the bird's head um, and there wasn't any skin or muscle on it, like this would be like uh, how the lower jaw um, lower jawbone would look. Um, the bottom row shows the jaw basically turned around, but you're viewing it from the inside of the mouth, basically, so the inner side uh, of the jaw. Um, and so we have here uh, the back of the jaw in the gavis, um, compared to phallocrocorax, which is a cormorant, podiceps, which is a grebe, and dendrocygna, which is a duck. Um, and you'll notice here that the back of the jaw in the gavis does not look very much like a duck, does it? Um, so, for example, in a duck, there's a very long projection coming off the back of the jaw. You can see like this hook-shaped structure at the back. Uh, we talked about this uh, when we talked about um, Galloensiri in the main series, Dinosaurs, the second chapter. This is one of the main characteristics that pretty much all modern Galloensirians have is a big projection at the back of the um, jaw. Whereas Vegavis has a little bit of projection, but not very much. Um, so it's not very Galloensirian like in that respect. Um, in fact, it is more similar to some of these other birds that are pictured on the slide here, uh, which are members of neo Aves and not of Galloensiri. Um, so what does this mean? Well, I mean, it's hard to say with these kinds of things. Like, uh, it, it, it is technically possible that Vegavis was a really weird Galloensirin that evolved a different jaw structure. Um, but at least from the perspective of jaw anatomy, um, it seems like the Gavis more closely resembles certain members of neo Aves than it does to gallo and Seri. And in recent years, some studies, including some research that I've been involved in, have kind of cast doubt on the idea that the Gavis was a member of um, the Anseriforms or even a member of gallo and Seri at all. Um, and so uh, this study on its jaw anatomy seems to kind of support that, but... Uh, of course, a more more detailed analyses would need to be done to really figure out like exactly what kind of bird Vegavis was. Um, but um, it it is interesting to you know to to see this discrepancy between its uh, kind of proposed 
as seriform affinities versus what its jaw anatomy actually shows. Um, do you have anything to add before we move on? This is pretty interesting. Uh, <laughs> I'm definitely curious too as to, you know, if there's something else going on here that we just don't know about yet, or if maybe Vegavis really is misplaced. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I mean, if you look up pictures of Vegavis, like a lot of them will show it like looking like. Uh, a duck or a goose or something like that uh, but the truth is like we, we don't have most of its head right so we we don't actually know if the rest of its head uh, looked that duck like or not uh, but certainly the very back that we have of this jaw does does not so um yeah we'll, we'll see how this plays out um let's move on to the next slide and now we're moving into the next episode uh, where we started looking at neo aves which uh, includes 95 percent of all living birds so everything that is not an ostrich-like bird, or a duck-like bird, or a chicken-like bird belongs to the group neo um, And so we talked about uh, kind of how difficult it is to kind of sort out the phylogeny of this group, um, as well as a few of the groups of neo -Aves. We started looking at those in this episode. Um, so one of the groups that we looked at in this episode were the pigeons. And uh, pigeons don't have a great fossil record. And but uh, there are a lot of living species of pigeons, and so we can still do some evolutionary analyses on them. Um, and so a new study came out looking at um, basically the biogeography of pigeons, um, like where do pigeons live, and how did they get there, and when did they get there, that kind of thing. Um, so um, modern pigeons are found pretty much all over the world. Um, and pigeons are very good flyers, so they get pretty much everywhere. And so it's been really difficult to figure out the actual kind of biogeographic history of pigeons. Like, like, how did they, like, when did they get from one place to another? And from, from where did they get from one place to another? Um, it's very hard to tell. Um, so this study uh, basically um, studied the uh, phylogenetic relationships of the these pigeons, and so they reconstructed a phylogenetic tree, as you can see here, and then they mapped out where modern pigeons are found to figure out, um, you know, how did pigeons move between different uh, regions of the globe um, at different times. Um, and they found something quite interesting. Um, so a major takeaway of the study is that it seems that for pigeons, a major center of their diversification has been Melanesia, which is the region that includes New Guinea and kind of surrounding smaller islands. Um, and so on the phylogeny here, uh, these are represented by the branches that are kind of colored in teal, um, kind of the blue-green color here. Um, so the blue-green branches are the pigeons that are found in Melanesia today, um, as well as kind of extrapolations of like ancestral branches that might have been found in um, Melanesia. And you can see here that many of the ancestral pigeon lineages, so the ones that you know lead to the branching events that, uh, between the modern species, um, uh, are estimated to have originated in Melanesia, which is very unusual because most of the time we don't expect organisms to kind of originate on smaller islands uh, and then disperse to bigger land masses and gain a foothold there. But it seems that that is what pigeons have done a lot of the time, is that many branches originated in Melanesia, and they spread, uh, especially to Australia and to Asia. Um, so that is a, quite a curious um, pattern that we're seeing in, in pigeon evolution. Um, however, that being said, uh, something else that they take away from the study is that uh, it is very difficult, even for pigeons, to gain a foothold on these continental environments. So even though um, a lot of pigeons have dispersed from Melanesia to like the Eurasian uh, continent, for example, uh, in, very, in very few cases have they actually managed to diversify very far after they actually reached Eurasia. So Eurasia is represented by the black branches on here. Um, and so there, there are like maybe one or two like major diversifications um, that um, happened after uh, pigeons got there from Melanesia. Uh, but in many cases, um, the pigeons that got to uh, Eurasia from Melanesia um, only evolved into like one or two species that are still alive today. Um, and so it, it, is, it is quite difficult, it seems, for pigeons um, to gain a foothold, uh, even though they have done it. Um, 
And uh, same same thing goes for for dispersing from Melanesia to Australia. Um, so there's one big radiation of Australian pigeons. Like uh, Australia, Australia um, is represented by red here. So you can see like there's one big radiation um, here uh, descended from a single colonization event. Um, but in many of the other cases where pigeons have spread to Australia, um, like they haven't led to major, uh, many, many, many different species um, appearing from that event. Um, and so it is quite difficult. Um, something else you might notice here is that uh, if you look at the phylogeny and match it up to the continental kind of color coding here, um, this phylogeny estimates that all pigeons in general uh, might have originated in the Americas, which is represented by blue um, in the color coding here. However, the authors are not very confident in this result. And the reason for this is that there's actually a lot of uncertainty as to how the uh, different groups of pigeons relate to each other at the base of pigeon phylogeny. Um, and so it may be that like all the American pigeon groups actually form a group that's related to each other. Um, and if that's the case, then uh, the the case for um, um, all pigeons originating in the Americas is not as strong. Um, but uh, it is interesting, so might as well point it out. Um, I, I wish the pigeon fossil record were better than it actually is, but uh, sometimes we have to work with what we got, and uh, we got quite a bit of modern data to work with. Um, and uh, this gives us some pretty interesting insight into an often neglected, I think, group of birds. Um, do you have anything to add to this? It's interesting looking at the um... The branching patterns here and how they've been kind of tied to geography mm -hmm. um just because it's just a bunch of interesting observations and how i guess easy it is for um lineages to go one way and then kind of reverse course yeah um i mean like i'm, I'm looking at this australian group seemingly emerging from uh, melanesia and you have like that one little purple branch like i'm gonna go right. back up north yeah, right. <laughs> things are kind of better up there exactly <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, birds are definitely a fascinating group of uh, you know, of organisms to study when it comes to biogeography because they they kind of get everywhere, right? They can fly, um, so uh, their their biogeographic patterns are often very very complex, and uh, they can tell us a lot about uh, what influences the dispersal of organisms. Um, I wonder if yeah. the mm -hmm. difficulties in gaining a foothold that you talked about have anything to do with that? You know, there are other lineages of birds there that are kind of doing similar things to what the pigeons do or if, if there's if there's a story there in that sense yeah definitely uh, that would be really interesting to get further research on it i i, I would um, um echo your thoughts there I, I would suspect that that that's probably one of the reasons that you know there, there are already other birds that are doing uh, potentially similar things so it, it that that might be indeed a, a challenge for any kind of newly arriving organism um, to have to you know deal with, um, even if they actually make it to to that other landmass. Um, yeah. So uh, let's go on to the next slide. Oh, and uh, where we're going to talk about quite an interesting uh, extinct bird on this slide. Um, so we're going to talk about the genus Perplexi cervix. Now this is a bird that I did not mention when uh, we did the original Dinosaurs the Second Chapter series. Uh, but it's a weird, very weird bird. Um, so originally, uh, Perplexi cervix was named based on specimens from the Eocene of Germany. Um, so these are specimens from the very prolific Messel uh, formation, which has produced many nice fossil bird specimens. And you can see some examples of these on the left here. Um, so Perplexi cervix uh, was a bird that had uh, quite a small head um, and pretty long wings, but uh, was most likely spending a lot of time foraging on the ground based on like um, kind of the proportions of its toes. Um, I, the reason I did not mention it in the original Dinosaurs of the Second Chapter series was because we we're not really sure what kind of bird it is. Um, so looking at these meso specimens, for example, people have pointed out that. Um, it has some similarities to the screamers that you know that that group of weird chicken-like waterfowl that we mentioned earlier. Um, some people have also mentioned that it has other similarities to vultures. Very weird. Of course, these are very distantly related groups of birds. So yeah, it's a very hard bird to place when it comes to phylogeny. Um, but the weirdest feature of Perplexi cervix and the reason it was named. So the name Perplexi cervix. Uh, means weird neck, basically, and that's because of the weirdest feature that it has, which is its neck vertebrae. So on the surface of its neck vertebrae, um, it's covered in all in these tiny bumps, basically, um, and 
We've never seen structures like these on the vertebrae of any living birds, for example. And people did notice these, like, way back in the day, like, um, well, no, I, I don't know about way back in the day, but people did notice these structures, like, long ago on certain uh, fossil birds from the vessel, um, and they pointed out that, oh, yeah, th these birds have weird bumps on their neck vertebrae, or a more kind of technical term would be tubercles on, on these vertebrae, um, and we don't see, see these in any living birds, um, so what are they? Well, uh, an early idea to explain these structures was that maybe these birds suffered from some kind of disease that modern birds don't get, and that was causing them to grow these weird bumps on these vertebrae. Maybe, maybe. But then, uh, people found more specimens of perplexy cervix, and th this was when perplexy cervix was actually properly named, um, and they found that there were multiple specimens of this bird that were clearly all the same species, and they all had these bumps on the vertebrae, and so it was very unlikely that they all happened to be suffering from the same disease, right? And so um, it was suggested that, no, this, this, these were genuine anatomical features, um, but very weird anatomical features, and we don't know what they do. Um, so, and that was it for a while. So we had perplexy cervix, this weird bird with weird bumps on its neck vertebrae known from the Eocene of Germany. Now, earlier this year, um, a new study came out uh, describing a new species of perplexy cervix, um, and this time it's from uh, earlier in the Eocene, from the UK. Um, it's from the London Clay Formation, so the same um, location that Daniel Zavis was found in. Um, and uh, because we have vertebrae of this new species, and it has also has like these weird bumps on the neck vertebrae, um, it was suggested that this is probably a close relative to perplexy cervix from Germany, and it was classified in the same genus. Um, so we actually have more than just the neck vertebrae. There are additional specimens that have other parts of the body as well. Um, and so this new species was named Perplexi cervix pulsituberculata, quite a mouthful of a name. Um, uh, pulsituberculata basically means like um, fewer or like smaller, smaller bumps, and that's because it has fewer and smaller bumps than, than a Perplexi cervix microcephalon from Germany. Um, but it does have them, um, and it does seem to be like a similar, uh, at least sort of bird um, to Perplexi cervix from Germany. Um, now, the uh, specimens of perplexy cervix tuberculata are quite valuable for understanding this bird better because the mesal formation, as we mentioned before on the show, it's really nice for preserving highly complete skeletons of birds. Uh, and it's, in some cases, it even preserves soft tissues like the feathers of these birds. So again, we can get a lot of insight into the, like, the overall proportions and even appearance of these birds uh, from the mesal specimens. But the problem is, most of these mesal specimens are like basically squashed flat, and you can kind of see this in the figures here from the microcephalon um, specimens, right? Um, so if you want to look at the actual details of these bones, or like how these bones actually look in three dimensions, you can't get a lot of information from the mesal specimens, but you can from the London clay specimens. Um, so the London clay specimens um, are often not quite as complete as the mesal ones, although they, they often are like pretty decently complete, especially for bird fossils. Um, but perhaps more importantly, the um, specimens are preserved in three dimensions, and so uh, you can get even more detail of like the structure of these bones from the London clay specimens. And perplexy cervix shows a few things. Um, first of all, is that uh, we have a little bit from the skull, for example, and the features of the skull suggest that perplexy cervix is not a galloancerin, so it is probably not closely related to screamers, despite some of the um, uh, screamer-like features that were pointed out in previous papers. Um, in fact, some of the um, uh, specimens of perplexy cervix tuberculata were uh, mentioned in the same paper that named Daniel Zavis and said, oh yeah, we have these other screamer-like specimens. We we don't know if they're the same as Daniel Zavis or not, probably not, but they're also like screamer-like things. Um, but um, this uh, this new study suggests that these particular specimens actually are perplexy cervix, a non galloancerin uh, bird. Um, so if it's not a galloancerin, then what was it then? Uh, well, um, this study proposed an intriguing possibility because they noted that some of the uh, bones, especially in the wing of perplexy cervix, are actually quite similar to the bones of bustards. So bustards, if you don't know or don't remember from Dinosaurs, the second chapter, are a group of mostly um, ground-dwelling birds, even though they can still fly. Um, and in fact, they are still quite good flyers. In fact, they can fly for very long distances, uh, even though they prefer not to. Um, 
and they can get quite big. So bustards today, the big ones, are, are some of the biggest uh, flying birds um, that, that are still alive today. And something interesting and frustrating about the bustard fossil record is that we basically have almost none of it. <laughs> so bustards are not known for a very good fossil record. Like, uh, And the few that we do have mostly come from the Neogene, so the Miocene onwards. So we don't have any clear uh, examples of bustards from the Paleogene period, but if perplexy cervix was closely related to bustards, then we would finally have like an early member of the bustard lineage all the way back in the Eocene. Um, and we know they must have been around because all the other major bird groups are around. Um, so uh, if this is the case, then perplexy cervix would be a very important find indeed for understanding the evolution of bustards. But of course, um, this is still, you know, a kind of preliminary hypothesis at this point. Like no one has run an actual phylogenetic analysis like showing that perplexy service um, is likely closely related to bustards. Um, however, it is a very intriguing possibility. And I, I will say like looking at their figures, like the, the wing bones do look pretty bustard like so. I could see it potentially being the case, and perplexy cervix would have been like this uh, primarily ground bird with well-developed wings, which would make it quite similar in terms of ecology to to bustards. So I, I could buy it. I could buy it. Um, but of course, I would like to see more evidence um, before kind of confidently saying what kind of bird perplexy cervix is. Perplexy cervix uh, is the only member of this group, um, Perplexi cervicidae, um, that has been named for it, um, or at least an only named member of this group. Um, and the main thing that unites members of this group are, of course, like the, you know, or at least the most prominent characteristic of, of this group is like these um, uh, weird vertebrae with like bumps all over them. So, what are these bumps actually for? Well, that was a subject of another study that came out this year, um, as we'll see on the next slide. Um, it shares uh, some of the same authors as the previous study that described perplexy cervix tuberculata. Um, so this time they looked at the neck vertebrae of not only like perplexy cervix proper, but also of similar neck vertebrae that were found in the Eocene of France. Um, so they didn't come with like the rest of their bodies, uh, but you can tell from like the neck vertebrae that these are probably uh, you know the same kind of bird because they also have are covered in these um, weird bumps. Um, now in the previous slide you probably couldn't really see the bumps very well from the figures up there, um, but here's a bigger picture on the left uh, from this new study um, that shows these neck vertebrae with their their weird bumps. Um, and so check these out. Like these are just bizarre structures. Like we really don't see these structures in any other kind of bird. Um, so besides perplexy cervix proper and these uh, new uh, France uh, or these new French specimens, um, there is another bird from the Messel um, that has been named uh, Dynamopterus or Idiornis um, tuberculata. Um, now the genus uh, Idiornis, which is now lumped into Dynamopterus, um, was mostly named for um, a group of fossil birds that we think are closely related to Seriemas. Um, so they're a group of South American uh, predatory birds with really long legs. Um, we'll, we'll talk about them later, um, and, and we've already talked about them before in the series, of course. But it, you know that that doesn't matter too much for this story. Um, uh, Dynamopterus tuberculata was thought to be one of these, you know, seriema like birds, um, but uh, it was also found with these, uh, you know weird bumps on these neck vertebrae. In fact, it was probably the first example where, where these bumps were noticed. Um, and that, that's why it was named tuberculata, specifically for these uh, tubercles on the neck vertebrae. Um, now, like the other mesal specimens, the, uh, the only specimen we have of Dynamopterus tuberculata is kind of squashed flat. We can't see many of the details. And so there's a very real possibility that it's not actually a member you know, of the Dynamopterus genus, um, but in, instead is actually another perplexy cervicid. Um, and so if that's the case, then it would be another example of one of these you know, weird Eocene birds. Um, but in any case, the, um, the new study here took a close look at the structure of these neck vertebrae, especially looking at these new French specimens. And so what they did was they did a CT scans of the specimens, and they, so they were able to look at the internal structure of these neck vertebrae as well. And so, uh, as you can see on the right here, these are like CT cross sections of the neck vertebrae in these weird perplexy cervicid bones. Um, 
So on the top two rows are examples of, of neck vertebrae from these perplexes cervicid. You can see um, the bumps very clearly uh, on the out, outside of the vertebrae. And on the bottom row is a uh, neck vertebrae from a modern bird, like a quote unquote normal neck vertebra from a modern bird. Um, I, I think they use a swan for this. But in any case, you can see some very notable differences here. And uh, a big one is that the bone walls of perplexy cervix and its kin are incredibly thick. Look at how thin they are in a modern, like, you know, a living bird, a normal bird vertebra. Um, they are basically paper thin, like a lot of bird bones are in a normal uh, neck vertebra uh, for a bird. But in perplexy cervix, these bones are really thick. Um, something else that they were able to confirm is that these bumps are probably not the result of disease. And there are a few lines of evidence for this, in addition to the stuff that's already been mentioned earlier. Um, for one, is that they are more or less symmetrical across both sides of the vertebrae. Um, so, you know, that, that's something you would expect from, like, uh, you know, a natural part of the, the, the animal and, and not caused by disease. For another, the bumps are never found in parts of the bone where they would get in the way of, say, nerves or blood vessels um, or, like, the connections between two different neck vertebrae. Like, the bumps are never found in those regions that, you know, are, are important for the animal's uh, function. Um, they're, they're only found in, like, specific parts of the, of the vertebrae where they wouldn't get in the way of these other functions. Uh, so that also suggests that it is not, like, the result of disease. Okay, so... With all that said, this is all really good information about the structure of these vertebrae, but why were the vertebrae like this? Like, what are these bumps for? Uh, well, we don't see these structures in other types of birds. And in fact, I would say we don't see these structure in the neck vertebrae of probably any other kind of animal, really. But uh, we do see a similar texture of the bones, and we see these little bumps on the bones in a particular species of rodent that lives in Africa today. And this is the maned rat, also called the crested rat. Now, this is one of my favorite mammals. And I, in fact, I would say the maned rat is one of my favorite animals of all time, because it is so strange. Um, so it has a very weird way of defending itself. Um, so the maned rat is, um, you know, it, it's not a huge rodent, but it, it's bigger than your, than your average rat. And uh, it is covered with really long hair, uh, so it has this, um, this, these long dark hairs that it can like erect into a mane like all along its back uh, when it gets frightened. And you know, for a long time, it was wonder like what is the significance of such a display because when it like erects these long hairs on its back, it also exposes like these uh, boldly patterned uh, colors on the sides of its body. It has like brown and white fur on the sides of its body that are exposed when it when it flares this this mane up um well it turns out the mane rat has a really interesting way of protecting itself um so what it does is that it chews on the uh, this particular species of plant that is incredibly poisonous to like basically any other kind of animal um but for some reason that we don't fully understand the mane rat is not affected by this poison um but this poison is incredibly strong. Like the local peoples of Africa, um, in in the re in these regions where the main rat lives, will take poisons from this plant and use them to kill elephants. Like think about that. This is poison strong enough to kill elephants. Um, but the main rat is not affected by the poison. And what it does is that it chews up these plants and then it smears them into its fur. And its fur actually has a unique texture to it. It's very spongy, so it can actually hold liquids in it. And so it basically mixes like th these plant toxins with its saliva, smears them into its spongy fur that holds onto the toxin. Um, and so when it is threatened by a predator, it flares up its um, its fur as this kind of display to show the predator, like, hey, don't get any closer, you know? Uh, I'm not good to eat. You better not try it. And if the predator does try it, well, it's going to get a mouth, whole mouthful of that poison, and it's probably going to have a really bad day at the very least. Um, now, uh, what does this have to do with the bones of the maned rat? Well, it turns out that the maned rat um, has specific adaptations 
to withstand being bitten by the predator while this is happening. So, you know, while, while the poison does its work, right, the main rat is going to have to, like, survive actually getting bitten by a predator um, um, for the poison to actually work. And so the main rat has a lot of weird, like, features in its skeleton um, to kind of make it stronger and more able to withstand predator bites. And one of the most um, remarkable features that it has. It has this really reinforced skull that is covered in like these tiny bumps all over it. And this is part of its defense um, is that, uh, yeah, when a predator bites down on it, um, it, it can like at least survive that initial kind of bite before the predator kind of spits it out and, and like goes off to, you know, probably be really sick, uh, if not uh, fatally so. Um, and so uh, the author suggests that this is the first example of a similar kind of defense found in a fossil bird. Um, so what they suggest is that the neck specifically of perplexy cervicids was reinforced in this way um, to withstand a predator bite. Um, and of course the neck is a good place to reinforce because a lot of predators like to go for the neck, and there are a lot of you know nerves and blood vessels there that uh, if you know were were damaged, then would quickly kill something. And so, of course, a lot of predators go for the neck. Um, but if this bird had a specially defended um, neck, then that could potentially protect it at least from the bites of relatively small predators. Um, now, of course, the main rat has like this kind of armored head uh, in conjunction with its kind of poison defense. Um, so did perplexy cervicids have like an additional defense like to go with this armor? Um, we don't know. Uh, and we, we can't really find evidence of things like poison in the fossil record. At best, it's very, very difficult. And so um, it's hard to say like what kind of defensive adaptations might have gone along with this in a perplexy service if this is indeed what these structures were for, which, I don't know, I, I can't think of any better ideas at this moment, at least. Um, the author suggests that we know that in some modern birds today, especially those that feed on the ground, um, they will uh, play dead when they're grabbed by a predator. And so this might have been the case um, for perplexy cervicids too, um, where maybe they were grabbed by a predator, uh, they would play dead, and then this predator uh, loses interest in them um, since they oh, this thing is already dead. Never mind. Um, and then uh, when they're let go, maybe the bird can make its escape, or at least that, that's the idea. Um, now, this is not mentioned in the paper, but actually has precedent in modern animals, uh, which was pointed out to me by um, Robin Beck, who is a paleontologist who studies marsupials. Um, he pointed out to me that actually opossums of the genus Didelphus, so that includes like the most familiar opossums, uh, at least the most, um, the most famous of all opossums, the Virginia opossum, the one that lives in uh, North America. Um, so opossums of, the genus, opossums of the genus Didelphus are well known for playing dead when they're threatened. Um, that's one of their main defenses against predators. And it turns out that they have a very weird thing going on with their neck vertebrae too. Um, so the neck vertebrae of uh, Didelphus opossums kind of interlock with each other. And so they, that makes the neck, ver neck of these opossums um, very stiff. So in the up and down direction, they can't flex as much as a normal mammal would be able to. Uh, but it comes in very handy when they're using their playing dead defense because uh, for a similar reason to why the main rat has an armored head. Um, basically, uh, if a predator grabs onto an opossum's neck and it plays dead, and predator kind of you know mouths it for a while before losing interest, uh, this means that the uh, opossum's neck will hopefully uh, at least be shielded from the worst of the worst of the damage by having these reinforced uh, interlocking neck vertebrae um, while this is happening. And so once the predator leaves, the opossum can wake up and go about its day uh, without being too badly hurt by the experience. Um, and so uh, this would be a really interesting parallel to what seems to be going on with these perplexy cervicids if like the playing dead hypothesis is what indeed was going on. Um, so yeah, real, uh, big thanks to Robin Beck for pointing this out to me because I, I think that that is definitely a, a potential analog that could be looked into. Um, but in any case, uh, yeah, what a weird adaptation in these birds. Um, and I am really curious to find out more about these things. Um, do you have any further thoughts about this? I was today years old when I learned about this group of animals to begin with. I, I, I had no idea that 
there were fossil birds like this. Um, and I, I got to say, just that was a, a whirlwind explanation to listen to. <laughs> I, I, I had no idea that that was going to go in that direction. Um, <laughs> I'm I'm very curious too. I mean, yeah, like if the closest analogs, well, well, potential analogs that we could get with these birds are coming from mammals, well, mm -hmm. already this is proving to be one of the most bizarre fossil birds in the world. Exactly. <laughs> I <would think>. yeah. <laughs> um, the name certainly fits. Yes. <laughs> No, I would say that, that might be one of my favorite uh, new uh, fossil bird studies to come out this year. Uh, but unfortunately, we do have to move on. Um, and there are many more interesting studies to talk about. Um, so we're going to skip ahead to uh, an update for episode 7, which is where we talked about shorebirds. So this is a group of birds that includes things like plovers and sandpipers um, and gulls and ox and many other birds, uh, many of which do indeed live on shorelines, but not all of them do. Um, they're quite a remarkable uh, radiation of birds here. Now, um, we mentioned in the episode that early fossils of shorebirds are very rare and often very fragmentary. So uh, whereas we have some pretty decent uh, fossils of many other major groups of birds from the Eocene, for example, uh, we had almost nothing for shorebirds, basically. And so uh, this new find, which presented on this slide, is quite an important one. So this is yet another bird from the Lendon Clay Formation, the gift that keeps on giving. Um, uh, so this is a fossil shorebird um, of a new genus, Caradri similis, um, and I, I would say it's like pretty convincingly a shorebird. It has a, a lot of features that are uh, shorebird features, um, and it's known from a pretty decent partial skeleton. You can see here it has several of the wing bones, many of them well-preserved. It actually also has a, a big um, uh, breastbone that is not uh, uh, shown on the slide here um, that is also quite well-preserved as well. Um, and uh, the authors of this paper suggest that um, Caradri simulus specifically is uh, closely related to the group of shorebirds called Caradri. Um, and so we talked about this in the episode, but if you need a refresher, uh, this is a group of uh, shorebirds that covers like the plovers, uh, oyster catchers, uh, stilts and avocets. And so this is an early member of like the big group that will eventually give rise to uh, things like uh, the kill deer that Joan uses as her avatar for the show. Um, and so this is a really nice find. Uh, so first of all, it is from like like the, probably the best uh, shorebird uh, fossil that we have from this time period, I would say. Um, and in addition, it can also be identified as a very specific uh, member, or at least uh, a member of a very specific group uh, of shorebirds too. Um, and so this will be very helpful in helping us understand, for example, the early origins of this group, um, like what what their early anatomy was like, as well as like when these groups originated as well. Um, so I'm glad that we have this <laughs> this uh, this nice uh, shorebird fossil um, to look at now. Um, now we're going to look at. Uh, some more shorebird fossils on the next slide, but these are uh, much more recent in geologic time. Uh, these are from the Pleistocene. Um, and so specifically, these are fossils that seem to be similar to a particular species of shorebird called the Plains Wanderer. Uh, we talked about this species in the episode, but as a refresher, um, this is a species of shorebird that does not live on shorelines. Today, it is only found in grassland habitats in Australia, and it is highly endangered. So there's a lot of work being done to try and conserve uh, the plains wander. Um, now, the plains wander, even though it is only found in grasslands today, um, it is known from fossils, or at least like early relatives of it, of it are known from fossils that were um, kind of uh, were preserved in different types of environments, like woodlands, for example. And so we know that members of this lineage, or at least we can infer that members of this lineage, uh, probably transitioned into a grassland habitat over time. And now a new um, study uh, looks at fossils of birds that seem to be similar to the plains wanderer uh, from the Pleistocene, so in relatively recent uh, geologic time. And so what it found, uh, what the authors of this paper found, uh, was that these fossils from the Pleistocene uh, appear to have been on average bigger than the modern plains wander, but otherwise, um, or, or e even in terms of size, um, did not substantially differ uh, from 
modern planes wanderers in like any other respect of the, their anatomy that they looked at. Um, and so this suggests that these were uh, Pleistocene representatives of the same species as the modern planes wanderer. Now, what is especially noteworthy about this um, is not only that these are planes wanderer fossils, which is pretty cool in itself, but also that uh, these fossils were deposited in, envi in environments that were probably woodland environments as well, and not grassland environments. So here is evidence that members of the same species as the modern plains wanderer um, were more tolerant of like different types of habitats uh, than they are today, or at least they lived in other types of habitats compared to the same species living today. So the transition to only living in grassland environments happened very recently in geologic time, or at least that is what that is what is suggested here. Um, so this has some implications, first of all, not only for understanding the evolution of the plains wanderer, but also for conservation of the plains wanderer as well. Because if plains wanderers used to live in other types of habitats, then maybe conservationists today can consider reintroducing them or into other habitats because they at least have the potential to, you know, uh, kind of thrive in non-grassland environments as well. And in fact, this is a kind of conservation strategy that has been suggested for other types of Australian animals. For example, the uh, mountain pygmy possum, which is a very endangered marsupial living in Australia, um, uh, is only found in mountains today, but is known from the fossil record to have once lived like in rainforest habitats, basically. Um, so people have suggested the possibility that, you know, we don't have to be confined to like the very restricted ranges that these animals are living in today if we want to reintroduce them to the wild and build up their populations. We can consider like habituating them to other types of habitats because at least, because at the very least, um, they do seem to have the potential to do so. And we know that they lived in those environments in the not too distant past. Um, and so it may be worth trying um, if like their numbers in their current range keep dwindling to kind of introduce them to other parts of um, Australia, even if they're not environments that they're found in today. Um, so this is a pretty interesting study, I thought, um, that has implications for conservation um, about a very strange species of bird. Um, do you have anything to add to this? It's kind of like, a, I guess, a responsible form of rewilding, isn't it? Right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty neat. Yeah. I, um... It is interesting to see that um, we have a case of like, oh, in prehistoric times, we have, you know, a larger version of animal that's around today. But in this case, it's it seems to have been more or less the same genes and species. Right. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so uh, moving on to the next slide. Um, so we're moving on to the next episode as well here. Um, and this was the episode where we introduced the big water bird clade, which was recently given the name Phaethocornithes. So uh, not all water birds belong to this group, but many of them do, and they seem to have diversified in kind of probably the most dramatic uh, ways uh, in terms of like the diversity of ways that use aquatic habitats. Um, this uh, this first story that we're going to talk about regarding this group of birds um, is a new fossil from the Paleocene of New Zealand um, called Clymenoptilon. Um, and so this is a fossil of an early member of the tropic bird lineage. So we talked about tropic birds in the episode. Uh, today, they're a group of seabirds that are only found um, in basically tropical waters, or at least mostly. Um, and uh, they are like beautiful, like angelic looking birds even. Like uh, they're mostly uh, covered in white feathers, uh, but uh, some of them have um, like brightly colored beaks or tail feathers, usually like red or yellow. Um, and they are amazing flyers. They spend most of their time like flying like over the ocean um, and they catch fish by diving down into the water and uh, catching fish like just below the surface. Um, they pretty much primarily come to land only when it's time to nest, and they nest on these remote islands where there are no land predators to bother them, ideally until humans brought them to the island. But uh, yeah, they're, they're like a remarkable group of modern birds. Um, but we know from the fossil record that early members of the tropic bird lineage um, 
used to be found in many other parts of the world as well, and not just places that are tropical today. Um, so uh, there are also stem tropical root fossils found in um, the UK, for example, also in North Africa, um, and also in North America, like continental North America. And there have been some bits and pieces of them uh, found, uh, or, or at least of what seemed like tropic bird like birds um, from the Paleocene of New Zealand. But uh, this year, we finally got like by far the most completely preserved of one of these New Zealand early tropic birds that confirms that yes, um, early stem tropic birds were found indeed in New Zealand. It even has a really nice skull, as you can see on the top here. Um, so yeah, this was an early stem tropic bird. It would have been pretty similar to um, many of the other stem tropic birds that have been found, like uh, Prothaton from uh, the Eocene of the UK. Uh, in fact, that, that's another one that's been found in the London Clay Formation. Um, so early stem tropic birds overall um, don't seem to have been um, as adapted for uh, you know uh, flying out uh, over the open ocean as the modern tropic birds seem to. They they seem to have been more similar in ecology to maybe like gulls maybe um, like most types of gulls tend to stick close to the coastal waters or close to the coasts. Uh, so it seems that early stem tropic birds were a bit more similar to that. Um, and what we have of this this um, new one is consistent with that as well. Um, but yeah, well, what a what a wonderful specimen. And I'm, I'm always glad to learn more about uh, this group of birds. Um, how about you? Well, skull. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm really pleased with the preservation quality here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, I think this is probably one of my favorite new fossil birds that was found this year, because uh, yeah, that that preservation quality is amazing. <laughs> now on the next slide, we're going to talk about another new fossil seabird. Uh, this time, it's a giant stem penguin. Uh, so this is actually a study that my uh, my supervisor Daniel uh, co-authored. Um, uh, it's kind of funny because there there are at least three different authors named Daniel on this paper <laughs> who all study fossil birds. Yeah, so my my supervisor is Daniel Field, uh, but there's also uh, Dan Sepka, um, who is a lead author on this paper, um, and he's a specialist in fossil birds and more specifically in fossil penguins. So it makes sense why he would be involved. Um, and there's also Daniel Thomas, who has also done quite a bit of work on fossil penguins as well. And all three of them were involved on this paper on fossil penguins. So that's kind of funny. Um, but in any case, um, as we discussed in the episode, um, penguins have an excellent fossil record, which is definitely not something you hear for every bird group, <laughs> for most other bird groups even. Um, we know of a lot of different species of stem penguins in the fossil record, and some of them grew to gigantic sizes, much bigger than the biggest living penguins. Um, and so in this new paper, the authors present what may very well be the biggest fossil uh, penguin of all. And so they named this new species Kumimanu fordisai. Um, so um, named after uh, the paleontologist Ewan Fordyce, uh, who was one of the supervisors of uh, Dan Sepka, uh, who has done a lot of work on like marine fossils of New Zealand, not just penguins, but also things like whales and such. Um, and unfortunately, um, uh, Ewan passed away uh, just earlier this year. Um, not when this paper came out, but like just a few months ago. Um, so uh, that's a that's a major major loss for the paleontological community. But um, as you can see, he is uh, very fondly remembered and very well commemorated um, in names such as Kumimanu Fordisai. Um, the the genus Kumimanu had already been named before for a different uh, species from the Paleocene of New Zealand, uh, but Kumimanu Fordisai um, appears to have been even bigger than that other Kumimanu species. Um, so. We don't have a huge amount from Kumimanu fortisai. You can see here um, the the skeletons here um, on the uh, on the right show how much is preserved. Uh, white are the preserved bones, so we mostly have bones from the wing and the shoulder girdle uh, from uh, Kumimanu fortisai. Um, but from these bones, the authors were able to estimate like how massive this penguin would have been, um, and they estimated that it would have weighed or somewhere in the vicinity of. 150 kilograms, which is as big as a large modern ostrich. Um, so yeah, like it, it is as big as the largest living bird living today. And uh, at least based on the material that we have, um, this is uh, this would make it more massive than any other of the giant fossil penguins that has been discovered before. Um, and so. Um, at least for now, this seems to be a leading contender for the biggest uh, stem penguin ever. Um, so that's pretty damn cool. Um, in terms of like uh, 
uh, height, overall height um, uh, of Kumimano Fortisai. It's very difficult to estimate because we do not have its hind limb bones, uh, so we don't know exactly how tall it would have stood. Um, but like if we kind of go off proportions in other um, stem penguins, um, the author suggests that it was probably somewhere in the range of like um, 1.6 meters tall. Um, so it's not as tall as the, the tallest people, um, but um, it's pretty darn tall for a penguin. And like if it if it went and tipped its head up and had that, with that really long beak, for example, now we, we don't have its head, but you know, based on other stem penguins, it probably had a, a long beak. Um, with, with that really long beak, it would have been you know comparable in height to you know tall people today. So um, yeah, like definitely a massive, massive penguin. Uh, if you're wondering about the other skeletons that are shown here, um, the the one in the middle, number four, is uh, another um, fossil penguin that was found at the same site, and in fact, it was named in the same paper. Uh, this is Pet Tradiptes, um, a name that means stone diver because it, it was found in some really, really hard rock, uh, basically. Um, so uh, Petra Diptes was not as big as um, Kumimanu, um, but it, it was a little bit bigger than the, than the largest living penguin um, living today, which is the, the third skeleton represented there. That's the emperor penguin. So this is a size comparison between these um, three different uh, types of penguins. Um, so yeah, we have Petra Diptes, which is a little bigger than the emperor penguin, uh, but then we have Kumimanu, which is is uh, probably the biggest uh, stem penguin that we know of. Um, so yeah, pretty cool find. Uh, what do you think? I think it's fair to say that we could probably call the Paleocene and Eocene the age of penguins at this point. <laughs> that would probably be fair, yes. <laughs> Let's go on to the next slide. Uh, so we're going to talk about a story that concerns the modern day in the next slide. It's, it's a bit of a tragic one, but you know, Hopefully one with hope. Um, so in, in our um, episode, we talked about the um, prosoleriform birds or tube nose birds. So this is a group uh, that includes the albatrosses and petrels and their close relatives, um, and how they are highly threatened in many cases by human activities today. Um, because these are birds that spend most of their lives out at sea and um, only come to land to breed for most part. Um, and they breed very slowly. It takes a long time to rear a baby tube nose up into an adult. Um, and once they um, are old enough to actually go out to sea themselves, um, it takes a quite a long time for them to be old enough to breed to begin with. Um, so um, any kind of like additional pressure that would not be what they evolved to cope with um, in the wild uh, would dramatically kind of um, endanger their survival. And unfortunately, a lot of human act human um, generated activities do. Um, and one of the main threats to prosoleriform birds is plastic pollution in the ocean. Um, because a lot of the time, prosoleriforms, um, they mostly feed by like, you know, swimming on the water surface, or some in some cases diving down into the water, um, and catching um, things like fish and squid um, in the water. Um, unfortunately, they often pick up bits of floating plas plastic, uh, mistaking them for food, and then uh, and then eat those as well, um, and in, in turn also feeding them to their chicks. And of course, that's not very good um, because they, they can't get any nutrition out of plastic, right? Um, so they're kind of filling themselves up on the, these like you know, garbage that, that uh, does no good to them. And not only that, but uh, plastic, of course, can contain chemicals that damage them, um, and the plastic itself can also uh, damage the, their uh, digestive system. People have actually documented um, cases of uh, prosoleriform birds where um, uh, their insides were damaged by all the plastic that they, they had eaten. Um, and in fact, they coined a new term for this called, I, I think, plasticosis or something like that, um, which is like a new type of pathology that previously we, we did not uh, recognize uh, in birds um, and is, of course, generated entirely by this human-made um, activity. So yeah, uh, prosoleriform birds are at grave risk of plastic pollution. And so what a new study did was try to identify um, what species and what regions of the world um, was it most likely uh, for prosoleriforms to be exposed to this danger. Um, and uh, what they did was they matched up um, the estimated density of kind of plastic um, in the ocean surface, because people have kind of done those estimates before, and combine that with data from like what we know about um, where these birds go when they travel. Um, so like what parts of the ocean do they frequent uh, based on like uh, animal tracking studies that have been done on these birds. And so they matched up these two different um, sources of geographic data and then 
tried to estimate like where in the world would prosolariform birds come most in most contact with plastic pollution and they came up with the map shown um, on the slide here and so the regions in dark purple are the regions where uh, plastic exposure risk is strongest um, for uh, prosolariforms. And you can see here that the Mediterranean and the Black Sea are like the highest risk places in the world for um, prosolariforms to encounter um, plastic pollution. Um, however, they're not the only regions um, that are of high risk. Um, the authors also found that in many places in the um, in the UK and the US and Japan, uh, the offshore waters there are also regions where um, a lot of uh, prosolariforms um, would encounter plastic. Um, and even then, like even if even if there was no plastic in all these uh, regions of the ocean um, that are under like or that are um, that count as exclusive economic zones of specific countries so like the direct offshore waters of specific uh, countries um, if we look into the open ocean um, the global ocean um, if we go go into the the high seas as they say um, there are still uh, many regions of high risk uh, to prosolariforms when it comes to plastic pollution uh, both in the pacific and the atlantic oceans um, and so on the bottom you can see a bit of a, a chart i suppose or a graph um, showing like um, overall the percentage of plastic exposure risk um, to, to, for for prosolariforms divided by region and you can see that Spain, because it's bordering the um, uh, the Mediterranean, is the is the country with the overall highest uh, plastic exposure risk for all um, prosolariforms um, uh, that that were um, studied here. Um, however, like even if we take out all the um, all the um, waters that are under like exclusive economic territory of certain countries. Um, uh, if we look only at the high seas, that's still 25% of the plastic exposure risk here. And so this really emphasizes the fact that uh, kind of conserving uh, seabirds is a is an international issue. Like we need international cooperation to be able to conserve these seabirds because you know seabirds don't care about nation borders, right? They travel all over the world. They travel into oceans where um, you know that there are not exclusive economic zones. Um, so. Uh, this is true of all, a lot of environmental problems that we require global co cooperation, but it's very true uh, in the realm of uh, bird conservation when it comes to uh, seabird um, uh, conservation especially. So uh, I think this is a very good um, um, and I, I think necessary bit of research to help us identify um, what needs to be done to help uh, these remarkable uh, birds survive. Um, what, what do you think? <laughs> I definitely agree. Um, it's good that we're able to quantify the sorts of data to really help address like the the large scale issue at hand. Um, I do definitely notice though, it's interesting that I'm looking at the plastic exposure risk for all track petrels mm -hmm. and like even in like the lowest areas, like it's global. Yeah. Like <laughs> plastic is just everywhere. And, yeah. and gosh, it, it just really magnifies the scope of this issue. Absolutely. <laughs> Let's move on to the next slide. Um, so in the next slide, uh, we go to episode 10. Um, so this was the group where we started looking at raptorial birds. Um, so in this particular episode, we looked especially at the vultures, hawks, and eagles, as well as the owls. Um, however, um, this is also the episode where we introduced the group Telleravies, which is a big group of birds. Um, and so this group of birds includes not only the different groups of birds of prey that we just mentioned, but also things like kingfishers and woodpeckers and parrots and songbirds. Um, and so uh, the study that I'm going to talk about on this slide actually concerns all of these birds and not just the raptorial ones. Um, so what was this study? Um, in a way, this study actually concerns really all birds, but the really interesting findings were in Telleravies, which is why I discuss it here. And so what the authors of this paper did was that they surveyed photographs of a bunch of different species of birds from all around the world. Um, and they tried to find evidence of birds using their hind limbs um, for manipulation. So of course, 
birds don't have hands like ours, right? And so one of the main ways that they interact with the other objects um, in their environment is by their feet. And many types of birds, as you probably know, will use their feet to like grab things or hold on to things um, or like bring things to their mouth or like carry things while they're flying. Um, so the, these are all things that various types of birds do with their feet. And so this study aimed to document like what types of birds actually use their hind limbs for manipulation. And so what they found here, they plotted this out, their results out onto their this phylogeny. Um, and so in yellow, so in the yellow circles are the species of birds where they found no evidence of using the feet for manipulation. Whereas in blue are birds that did exhibit uh, evidence for this based on photographic evidence. Um, and so they found something interesting. And so they found that the vast majority of birds that use their hind limbs for these purposes were members of Teller Aves. Um, there are a few exceptions here and there, but yeah, by and large, the vast majority of um, birds that use their hind limbs for manipulation are uh, Teller Aves. So things like raptors, things like parrots, uh, some of the groups of songbirds will also do this. Um, so why might this be? Well, the author suggests that this might have to do with the fact that Teleradians might have been ancestrally uh, tree-dwelling birds. And we talked about this in the episode too. Like one of the big kind of dinosaurian conquests of the trees probably happened in this group. Like many of the birds that actually live in trees um, uh, are Teleradians. Um, and so it may be that because Teleradians uh, evolved adaptations for, you know, perching in trees or like climbing in trees or simply hanging out in trees, um, their feet were kind of pre-adapted to uh, other functions like manipulating food or grasping things. Um, and so uh, within Teleradians, they found evidence that uh, the use of feet evolved many different times. So it, it evolved probably separately in all the different major like raptor groups. So like the, the hawk and eagle group, the owls, um, the falcons, uh, but also in things like mouse birds. Um, it's also evolved in some of the uh, barbets, which are relatives of woodpeckers. Um, it definitely evolved in parrots, which are very well known for being able to do this um, with their feet. And it evolved at least 14 separate times in the passeriform birds, which are the songbirds and their kids. And so uh, it does seem very plausible to me that there's this kind of logical transition from tree dwelling uh, to being able to manipulate objects with the feet. And so it's pretty cool that they were able to quantify um, this uh, occurrence in birds. Um, and so th this, I guess, could be another kind of major characteristic that we could uh, bring up when we talk about Teleradians is that they're, they're a group of birds that uh, have like frequently evolved the ability to use the feet to manipulate objects. Um, now, uh, let's go on to the next slide and go more specifically into some of the uh, raptor groups. Um, and so here we're going to talk about uh, two new species of large eagles. This is quite a quite a remarkable uh, new find, not just because giant eagles are cool, but also because of where it was uh, found. So there are these two new species from the Pleistocene of Australia, and may maybe extending a bit into the Pliocene as well. Um, they are uh, two species that were class that were classified in the same genus, Dinotoaetus. Um, but interestingly, they, they were not named in the same paper, um, but in two separate papers, but mo mostly from the same authors. Um, the first one that was named is the one on the left here, uh, Dinato Aetis Gaffe. Um, uh, this is this is not all there is of the uh, of the uh, fossils that we have, but uh, I, I just use an example. These are bones from the foot of Dinato Aetis Gaffe. Um, and uh, Dinato Aetis Gaffe uh, is noteworthy, especially because um, it is one of the largest eagles ever found. Like pretty much the only um, eagles that we know to be bigger than it are the Haas seagull of New Zealand, recently extinct, and also a Gargano Aetis from Cuba, uh, both of which we, dis we discussed in the original episode. Uh, Minato Aetis is one of the biggest eagles ever described and larger than any living eagle. Uh, whereas uh, Dinanto Aetis pachyosteus, um, which, is, uh, which was described in the second paper later in the year, um, was not as big as Dinato Aetis gaffe. Um, Dinato 
Haytus pachyosteus was um, about as big as the largest living raptor in Australia today, which is um, the wedge-tailed eagle. Um, but even though it was about the same size as a wedge-tailed eagle, it was, it was a lot more robust. Um, so uh, it was probably taking larger prey on average than the wedge-tailed eagle. So something else that's interesting about Dinotoetus is that the authors in their uh, phylogenetic analyses in both papers found that its closest living relatives are Afro-Eurasian vultures and not uh, any of the birds that we call eagles today. Um, and because of this, I've seen some people say that, well, doesn't that mean we should be calling Dinotoetus a vulture and not an eagle? Um, well, the thing about common names of a lot of birds of prey, as we talked about in the episode, I think, is that they often don't match up very well with the phylogeny. They tend to um, reflect more ecological or size categories. So pretty much all accipitromorphs that get pretty big and predatory uh, tend to be called eagles, whereas most of the ones that are specialized for scavenging tend to be called vultures. So as we mentioned in the episode, there are basically three different groups of accipitromorph birds that are all called vultures, but they are not each other's closest relatives. They are just all called that because they are primarily scavengers. Um, and there isn't really any reason to think that Dinotoetus was uh, primarily a scavenger. Uh, the bones of his feet, for example, show that it was probably very capable of preying on other animals. Um, and probably did so on a regular basis. But by any standard, it was certainly a big predatory accipitra form. Um, so I don't have any problem with calling it an eagle myself, and uh, neither do the authors of the paper, because if you read their comments on press releases and social media, they definitely do refer to Dinotoetus as an eagle. The other thing is that uh, the confidence that we have in this result that Dinotoetus is closely related to uh, Afro-Eurasian vultures yeah, like, uh, as far as the available evidence goes, um, and the rigor of their analyses goes, it seems like the best supported hypothesis at the moment, but um, I, I don't think it's out of the question, and the authors don't either, because they, they mention this in the uh, description of Dinotoetus pachyosteus, uh, like it turned out to be more closely related to some other group, uh, such as the uh, snake eagles, which um, are the closest living relatives of the Afro-Eurasian vultures. Um, so it may be that with further research, we'll find Dinotoetus closer to the snake eagles, in which case it would group with modern birds that we call eagles. Um, uh, people have also wondered, okay, so does this mean that Dinotoetus was a descendant of vulture-like ancestors that kind of went back to becoming a predatory animal? Um, as far as the phylogenies that the authors find go, this doesn't seem likely. Uh, probably um, the simplest option that these trees suggest is that Dinotoetus was a member of the lineage that was leading up to the Afro-Eurasian vultures, but it simply hadn't lost the, its predatory capabilities yet, and so kind of specialized scavenging evolved closer to um, the modern uh, Afro-Eurasian vulture group. Um, but it's quite an interesting piece of um, information about its evolutionary history. Uh, remember, the, the Pleistocene is a pretty recent uh, time in geologic terms, and so uh, pretty much all the species that we have alive today would have also been around in the Pleistocene, and so wedge-tailed eagles would have been around in the Pleistocene, um, living alongside these two um, uh, larger, or these more robust uh, species of eagles, which is uh, quite interesting because today uh, there are almost no big raptors in Australia at all. So the wedge-tailed eagle is one. And then the only other one is the um, the white-bellied sea eagle, which, as its name suggests, is mostly found on the coast. In the interior of Australia, uh, the wedge-tailed eagle is the only large raptor that's around. Uh, and so why aren't there any other giant raptors in Australia? Well, here's the answer, is that they used to have them but uh, until very recently, but they probably died out in the Pleistocene megafaunal extinctions. Um, and, uh, you know, probably not coincidentally, because, um, as mentioned earlier, Dinotoetus, um, both species were probably taking larger prey than the wedge-tailed eagle today, um, at least on average. Um, and so they would have gone after things like the young of gi giant marsupials, um, or like weakened adults of those giant of marsupials, um, or, and also uh, giant flightless birds as well. Um, 
And so when those large uh, terrestrial animals died out, it probably these two large eagle species went with them. Um, and the wedge-tailed eagle today, like, wedge-tailed eagles can prey on adult kangaroos. Like, they usually they do it by working together. Like, two eagles will work together to, like, attack uh, an adult kangaroo. But they're, they're capable of doing that. So, yeah, just, just imagine what, like, these two species of, like, even bigger and more, more robust eagles would have been capable of. Um, quite an amazing find. Um, so, yeah, giant eagles from Australia were some of the, definitely some of the highlights of avian paleontology in the past year. Um, do you have anything to add? Marahute's ancestor. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yes, a uh, giant eagle from Rescuers Down Under. Yeah, that, that's a film I haven't seen in a while, but I, I definitely remember the giant eagle character. Um, so yeah, that, that that's pretty neat, right? <laughs> like, like um, today there are there are definitely no no giant eagles um in in Australia. I mean, the wedge-tailed eagle is pretty big, but I, it's uh you know not not exceptionally big for 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 an eagle. Um, but yeah, we we used to have we used to have those in Australia. Uh, <laughs> now now we have evidence of that. That's pretty cool. Um, let's uh, go on to the next slide. Um, so kind of moving temporarily away from the raptorial groups, um, we go on to episode 11, where we talk about three different groups of birds, the uh, trogons, uh, the kurols, and the mouse birds, uh, which are three groups of birds that many people have probably never heard of before. Um, but are quite remarkable for not only being unusual each in their own way, um, but also because they once were distributed a lot more widely around the world than they are today. Um, so today, all three of those groups are only found in tropical regions, and sometimes like only parts of tropical regions, like the mouse birds are only found in Africa, uh, the kurol, which is only known from one species today, is only found in Madagascar and the Comoros, um, and whereas the, the trogons are, are a bit more widely distributed, like they, they can be found in um, Asia, Africa, and South America, or uh, um, the tropical Americas, rather. Um, whereas in the past, we know they were wide, more widely distributed because we have um, stem trogon fossils from uh, Europe as well. Um, and so here's a new fossil trogon uh, from Europe, uh, from the Eocene of the UK, again, London clay formation. Um, and so this is from like basically the earliest Eocene, and so it's one of the oldest uh, fossil trogons that we have. Um, the only other one that we had before this that is, that is about equally as old um, is a septum trogon from the Eocene of Denmark, um, but it is only known from like basically the top of its skull, so we don't have the rest of its body, whereas Eotrogon um, from the UK gives us a much more complete look at what these trogons, um, early trogons, were like. And they were, it, it was on average smaller than most modern trogons. Um, and uh, the, the limb bones, there, there are some minor differences. Overall, the proportions were probably relatively similar, but there are definitely notable differences as well. Um, probably one of the big differences is that the beak of Eotrogon um, was a lot more slender than the modern ones. Um, so that could mean a few things, like maybe it was feeding differently, um, but something else that modern trogons use their beak for is to make nesting holes. Um, so what trogons will do is that they will bite holes. Yeah, but I said biting, not pecking. Bite holes in tree cavities um, and use those to build their nests in. Um, and so uh, if Eotrogon had a very different kind of beak from a modern trogon, maybe it was not as good as doing this. Uh, maybe it was not a, as good at doing this, and maybe it wasn't doing this at all and nesting in some different way. Um, of course, we, we don't have direct evidence of that yet, but um, it would be interesting to, to see if we can try and figure that out, like maybe do biomechanic studies, for example. Um, but in any case, yeah, Eotrogon is a basically our earliest um, stem trogon, or at least one of the earliest, and probably gives us the most complete look at what these birds were like. Um, I, I might add that the name trogon actually comes from uh, the Latin for uh, like to gnaw or to chew, um, and so that, that is actually named for their kind of nest building behavior um, that I just described. So yeah. <laughs> um, do you have anything to add to this before we go on? I'm glad that we have, you know, a, a new stem fossil that as is known from pretty great remains. Mm -hmm. I uh, I think it's also something to be said that, you know, hearing you describe you know a trogon as like chewing with its beak, you know, that's not really a uh, like a behavior that we're used to thinking about when it comes to birds, isn't it? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> now there there is one species of uh, of trogon that 
at least a reasonable number of people might have heard of, which is the uh, resplendent Trogon, uh, sorry, the resplendent Quetzal uh, from Central America, um, which, uh, yeah, if you're, if, you're, if you're into nature or birds, like, you've probably seen pictures of those um, very, 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 like, like just dazzling looking birds. It's, it's amazing. Um, so, yeah, very, very cool to find out more about the evolution of this group. Um, next, we go on to episode 12, where we talked about uh, things like the uh, uh, kingfishers and the woodpeckers and hornbills and their close relatives. Um, now, one of the groups of birds that we talked about in this episode were the honey guides, which, uh, compared to their cousins, don't look very flashy, but um, have a really interesting behavior, or actually, at least, actually, um, several interesting behaviors. But one of them, which is that in the wild, honey guides will cooperate or at least one species of honey guide uh, is known to cooperate um, with humans. Um, so it'll actually lead uh, humans to honey. And as the humans use smoke to appease the bees, um, the honey guide will come in and eat um, the uh, mo mostly the bees wax that, that the bees use to make their nests, um, but also on like uh, bee larvae as well. Um, and so uh, honey guides have a really weird diet is that they, they mostly feed on wax. I, I can't think of many other animals that do that, but yeah, here's a group of birds that mostly eats wax. Now, something we mentioned in this episode is that uh, it is often claimed that honey guides cooperate not only with humans, but also with honey badgers. And the honey badgers are a type of um, primarily carnivorous, although technically they're, they're omnivores, um, primarily carnivorous uh, mammal uh, found in Africa as well as some parts of Eurasia, um, some parts of Asia. It's often said, like, you know, when I was little, I, I had books about animals that said this, that, yeah, honey guides will do the same kind of routine with honey badgers as well. They'll guide honey badgers to honey, and uh, the badger will use its great strength to dig up or dig the, dig the beehive out of, either out of the ground or out of the tree. Um, and then finally, um, while the bees are kind of distracted by the disturbance, the, the honey guide can come in and feed on um, what remains of the nest. Um, however, there has not been any concrete evidence that this actually happens. Um, so it is something that uh, people have said happens through word of mouth, but no one has actually filmed this happening or like, or like, you know, done it like a rigorous or detailed report uh, of an observation of this happening. Um, it's basically all entirely based on hearsay. Um, and so there is an open question as to whether this actually happens at all. And so a new, a uh, team of authors actually sought to kind of pull all the evidence together to figure out, is it likely that this behavior actually happens or has actually happened in the recent past? Um, and what they did was really interesting. So um, they they not only considered like the biology of honey guides as well as of honey badgers, but they also went and interviewed um, uh, honey hunting communities who lived in those regions. So uh, people who lived in the regions who are likely to have observed such behavior happening. And uh, they interviewed uh, about 400 people, um, they basically asking them, like, do, uh, have you ever observed honey guides interacting with honey badgers? Do you believe that it actually happens? Things like that. Um, what they found was that 19% uh, of all the people they interviewed uh, reported having personally observed honey guides interacting with honey badgers. Um, and 28% reported the fact that they, they believed that this behavior is something that does actually happen. Uh, of course, that, that's only a small proportion of people. Um, and we, we all know that eyewitness accounts are not necessarily uh, very strong evidence. Um, but the authors did get a few interesting kind of takeaways from, from the study. Um, so first of all, uh, they considered well, whether or not like this behavior can plausibly happen. Like So this is kind of what the figure here is showing. Um, basically, uh, what are the steps that are need, required uh, for such an interaction to happen between a honey guide and a honey badger. So first of all, 
uh, the honey guide must be able to see honey badgers around during the day. Um, and I say during the day because honey guides are diurnal animals. They're only active during the day. And in the past, some people have said, oh, well, honey badgers are nocturnal, so they never run to honey guides. So this behavior is, is bogus. Um, but that, that's not strictly true. Honey badgers do sometimes, uh, you know, can sometimes be active during the day. And so, yes, the, this is possible. Like honey guides probably do see honey badgers sometimes. Um, and then the honey guides um, must, like, display to the to the honey badger like call out to the badger like get its attention in some way um and this also seems plausible uh, people have done experiments where um honey guides uh, where they showed like honey guides honey badgers and uh, the honey guide the honey guides seem to react to that uh, like they seem to start calling and such um but a lot of these experiments are kind of the results are kind of ambiguous because um they might be confounded by the presence of humans, right? Um, so we, we know that honey guides, we know for a fact that honey guides will like do this behavior with humans. And so if humans are present, it's possible that the honey guide is trying to get the attention of the human observers and not the not, not the honey badgers. So um, yeah, it, it, it's at least feasible that honey guides can do this, but we, we don't know for sure if they do, actually do. Um, and then the the honey badger must be able to like actually like see or hear the honey guy to be able to react to it. Um, and this is something that is not clear because uh, honey badgers don't have great hearing or um, or uh, eyesight. Uh, in fact, the um, uh, researchers who who study honey badgers have reported that uh, it is relatively easy to like sneak up on a honey badger and like catch it in a net or something because you know <laughs> they, they they can't see or hear very well. Um, so yeah, like whether or not they can actually see or hear honey guys displaying is still up in the air for the moment. Um, that being said, like you know, it, it is possible that a honey guide could adapt in some way to to make its display visible to or or audible to a to a badger. Um, so it is not out of the question that this could happen. Um, and then the honey badger needs to know to follow the honey guide um, to a bee's nest, um, and we don't know whether this happens or not, but. Um, people have done experiments like playing honey guide calls to honey badgers, and the honey badgers don't seem to react to this. Um, however, uh, the authors point out something I think that is really important, and that is we know that honey badgers learn how to forage um, in many respects uh, by learning how to do it. So they, a lot of their foraging is not instinctive. Like they, they had to spend a period of time basically following their mom around, um, like learning how to how to do various things, and so. Honey badgers in different regions are likely to pick up on different ways of foraging, and like there is evidence of this. Like different individual honey badgers will pick up on different strategies for foraging, um, and like become like really good at it, basically. Um, whereas other honey badgers might not have picked up the same types of tricks. Um, uh, so honey badgers are like a very learning-oriented species, um, and so it is definitely not out of the question that some honey badgers could have learned to follow honey guys and get a meal in that way um, and we just have never observed it before because you know it, it might be really rare like only some individuals do it or it only occurs in a certain geographic region um we do know for sure that honey badgers do like to eat honey and they do break into bees nests so that part is probably plausible and um honey guides certainly do scavenge um, beeswax from uh, bees nests that are left behind by humans and so it is not out of the question that they could scavenge from remains left behind by honey badgers too um so definitely all of these uh, steps are um you know if not likely then at least potentially feasible um they, they could occur and what's really interesting about the interviews that the authors did was that the people who believed that this behavior actually happens were mostly concentrated in a geographically small region so they, they were mostly peoples from uh, tanzania um, and so the authors um, conclude that if this behavior occurs and it could, then it is possible that this is something that only some honey badgers have picked up in some regions of Tanzania, um, and that if we are, t if we want to actually get concrete evidence that it happens, maybe we should kind of concentrate our field studies in those regions, and we should try to do these observations in a way that where the 
the presence of a human is not influencing the behavior of the honey guide. Um, and so that's is essentially their take, take home point is that, yeah, it, this could plausibly happen. And here are some steps we could take to try and confirm whether it does. And so I thought that was a really cool study. And it, it definitely seems like a really big uh, collaborative effort um, between like experts in both of these different types of animals, um, as well as um, with the local peoples um, who actually spend a lot of time observing these species. Um, and um, well, one more thing I'll mention before we move on um, is that if you think you've seen video of honey guides guiding honey badgers, yeah, those um, are not legit. <laughs> I, I'm sad to say, like, like uh, I, there, there, there was a very famous like clip done in like um, a quote unquote nature documentary um, where they showed a honey badger like being guided by a honey guide. But uh, yeah, that, that was a setup um, where they used like a um, stuffed honey guide specimen and kind of waved it over the badger's head, basically. Um, so uh, yeah, like there, there, there is no concrete evidence, um, no, no concrete like video footage of, of this behavior actually happening. Um, but oh well, like hopefully with this study, like we've we've taken a, a new step um in you know in kind of spurring on like further research into this question. Um do you have anything to add to this? Well, I think it's safe to say this is probably one of my favorite papers that you've covered so far. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um I do like the collaborative effort and I think the conclusion is really compelling and it just yeah. makes a lot of sense. I mean, like when describing animal behaviors, like it, it makes sense that certain behaviors would probably not be representative of the entire like species or even an entire population and so this idea that like some honey badgers not all of them not even most of them were engaging in this behavior or had learned to engage in this behavior like that would make sense and i, I think that's a really good way to investigate this further um i'm definitely curious as to how researchers could observe this without interfering yeah, like too much in a way that, like, for example, would make it seem like the honey guide is calling out to the people instead of the actual badger. Right. Um, yeah. <laughs> like it requires like the most extreme camouflage or something, like that, <laughs> yeah. which I know exists. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I I completely agree, and that that, that was the reason I, I was really looking forward to covering this study, even though it's not a paleontological study. Um, what was I really liked how they approached the, this question, um, and, and of course, like another reason is that because we we talked about this topic in the in the um, in the episode. But no, I, I really did want to highlight this one because uh, yeah, it, it, it's a it's a really nice um, um, kind of way of kind of get trying to get to the bottom of this. And yeah, I, I imagine like, like conducting follow up studies without like removing the human interference component is going to be a challenge um but yeah i, I imagine uh like you know you, you could probably set up a hide or something um and like you know, once the honey guys get used to that um maybe, maybe that, that could be a possible way of doing it but yeah i i, I imagine like it, it would be it would still be very very luck dependent as, as field studies tend to be so um yeah I, I definitely wish good luck to all the researchers who are interested in investigating this question i, I really look forward to to what they find um now let, let's move on to the next slide. Um, so we are in episode 13 where we talked about um, a group of birds called the Seriemas um, from South America as well as their extinct relatives such as the terror birds. Um, so yeah, this is a really cool group of birds. Um, they're one of the raptorial groups of Teleravians, so they're primarily uh, predatory, feeding on other types of vertebrates. Um, uh, Seriemas are not super well known among the general public, uh, but they're very distinctive looking. They have these really long legs, um, and uh, they mostly walk around uh, catching other types of animals to eat. Um, and one of their very curious features is that they have this claw on the second toe of their foot, so the second um, innermost toe on their foot. And so the innermost toe on their foot, other than the backwards pointing um, toe, um, and uh, they usually hold this toe or the, the claw on this toe like a little bit off the ground. And so in this way, they're kind of similar to um, the uh, dromaeosaurids, right, of the Mesozoic. Uh, so these are a group of like very bird-like uh, dinosaurs, but we're not, you know, they, they definitely weren't a modern bird. It's a group of um, dinosaurs, including things like Velociraptor and Deinonychus. Um, and so people have been interested in Seriemas because... They're basically the closest living analog in terms of having this one retractable toe uh, to the dromaeosaurids. Um, and so the, the question is, um, how do Syriamas use this claw um, 
And we, we kind of talked about this in the episode. Um, but the, the thing is, like, a lot of these accounts, like, a lot of these descriptions of um, claw function in Seriemas has mostly been, like, brief anecdotal uh, reports. And, like, not many people have really gone to the trouble of, like, documenting it with, with like, photographs and such, like, specific detail about how Seriemas use the uh, user claws. Uh, and so what, what this study did was that they, they went to a zoo and basically um, kind of observed how the Seriemas there were using their uh, foot claws. Um, and they, they did this in a few ways. So they, they did this by uh, kind of giving the Seriemas like various toys to play with, for example. Like they gave, gave them like a, um, I think like a key ring um, and also um, uh, a rubber snake because Seriemas will hunt snakes in the wild. Um, and they, they showed, they, they observed how the Seriemas interacted with these objects. And also um, as shown here, they observed how the Seriemas used the claw when they were feeding. So here is a Seriema like feeding on a dead mouse, for example. Um, and what they found was that uh, Siri mouse will often use the feet uh, in general for like holding items down on the ground and with a preference especially for using the second toe claw especially um, for using the second toe claw to, to pin things down um, so it seems that this is very likely to be the main function of the second toe claw that they usually hold raised off the ground to keep it sharp um, and th this is consistent with previous reports and it's consistent with what we said in the episode um, but it is pretty nice that they finally you know were able to like document this behavior um, on camera and like show in detail that yes this is indeed what is going on and uh, potentially, you know, this may have been what uh, dromaeosaurids were, were doing to some extent as well. Uh, but the authors especially point out that um, the proportions of the feet in Seriemas are like not not as similar to the, the larger dromaeosaurids like Velociraptor and, um, and Deinonychus, um, but to like relatively small ones, um, as well as to a closely related group called the Troodontids. Like they, they tend to have like longer and more slender feet with smaller claws. Um, like the Seriema feet are, are more like lows. And so um, I think that if we are to look for modern analogs, especially for uh, the kind of more slenderly built um, Mesozoic dinosaurs with these the retractable toe claws, um, uh, Seriemas are definitely a potential analog that we should be looking at. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, so it definitely doesn't change what we know, but it, it uh, is always nice to get this kind of uh, more detailed uh, uh, documentation and confirmation uh, of these behaviors. Um, do you have anything to add? So to say, um, yeah, as I, I was going to make the Dromaeus or connection as well. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm curious because I'm looking at the Sarim in the picture here, like the, the back foot there where the, the the toe with the larger claw is kind of resting on the ground, isn't it? It's not yeah. really raised in any way. Like, were, would all of the dromaeosaurids and or troodontids have kind of had their big claw raised up always, or would there have been some that would have held their feet like this? Yeah, so... um most of them will probably would have uh, raised the the claw like most of the time like uh their their toes have like very clear um specializations for for doing that with uh, much more so than, than in seriemas uh, but there there is like at least one troodontid called um Borogovia, which seems to have lost some of those uh, toe retracting specializations, so uh, it, it might have been a, an exception to that. Um, and in fact, the, the shape of its claw is different too. Like it, its claw is not quite as curved as, as it is in in many of the others. So that that might have been um, an exception um, to to that. But otherwise, yeah, the dromaeosaurs and troodontids um, were probably more adapted to holding the the claw off the ground than seriemas. Um, and, and yeah, in seriemas. Uh, even though, like, in while they're walking and such, like, they, they usually do raise the, the toe off the ground a little bit. Like, oftentimes, the, the tip of a claw still comes in contact with the ground, and you can see this in their footprints and such. Uh, so it, it definitely is not, like, a fully kind of, like, retracted thing, like uh, we, we think that some of the dromaeosaurids were, were doing. I know um, biomechanical studies have used, like, eagles and hawks as analogs for how Dromaeosaurs may have like dispatched with prey, but I've never seen Seriamas used before. Yeah, um, so like, yeah, we and we talked about this a little, I think, in the series too. But um, 
like the, the study that um, proposed like the hawk and eagle model for for dromaeosaurids um did did also um consider seriemas um but yeah it, it it basically pointed out kind of some some of the same things that we we were just discussing but which is that the seriema toe claws even even though they are kind of retractable they they do have some notable differences too uh from uh, dromaeosaurids and so in some ways they might not be as good analogs um ironically as as the hawks and eagles um uh, especially in like the proportions of the feet and such um but that being said like the, the pinning function of a claw um does seem to be like essentially shared among all these different groups so i think that much is uh, is probably a pretty compelling um you know argument for for the fact that dromaeosaurids were doing this as well yeah, i see that's neat yeah <laughs> And so, actually, this also relates quite a lot to uh, our next uh, study that we're going to talk about. So we just talked about retractable claws and trackways and such um, in seriemas. And so um, the question then comes up, like, what about terror birds? What about the extinct forest racids, which um, their closest living relatives are the seriemas? Did they also have this retractable claw on the second toe? Uh, well, uh, our next study kind of uh, gives us an answer to that question. Um, in terms of previous research that's been done, like on the anatomy of terror birds, um, not many people have commented on the anatomy of the second toe, like whether or not it was retractable. Um, if you look in like museum mounts or like um, illustrations in scientific papers, for example, we know people have definitely considered the possibility because uh, a lot of these illustrations of museum mounts will actually show the terror birds with a retractable second toe. Um, however, like there hasn't been a lot of in-depth study into like whether or not they this was actually how their toes functioned. Um, however, uh, in a new paper, the authors describe these trackways that were made by terror birds um, from the Miocene of Argentina, and they give us an answer to, you know, this question. Um, and so, as you can see here, these trackways show very clearly that terror birds had two main weight-bearing toes. You can see the most of the length of like two of the toes preserved as uh, in the in the tracks, um, whereas the well like anatomically it's a second only a little bit leaves an impression in the track um in some cases uh, a little bit of the claw is preserved too like i mentioned for seriemas earlier like the tip of the claw sometimes comes in contact with the ground um but yeah for most part like it seems that most of the toe is held off the ground in uh forest rassids and this of course corresponds to the to the innermost um toe uh, other than the backwards facing one that doesn't touch the ground it's seriemas or or terror birds um so the second toe on terror birds, uh, it seems, was also adapted to be retracted. Um, and so uh, this gives us like kind of, you know, first the first uh, definitive confirmation that this was how terror birds uh, held their toes. Uh, so that's pretty cool. So yeah, if you're doing paleo art of a terror bird, yeah, remember to give it that retractable toe. <laughs> well, if I ever draw one, I'll certainly remember that too. <laughs> um, is really like, is this our first ter like terror bird trick? Yeah, uh, the first ones that have been described, yeah. <laughs> this, is this is certainly proving to be a good year. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's go on to the next slide. Uh, so we're moving on to the next episode now. So in, in this episode, we finished off the uh, raptorial teleradian, so we covered falcons. Uh, but then we also discussed the parrots, which are some of their closest relatives, kind of uh, unexpectedly, you know. Um, now, in the episode, we talked about how uh, in the fossil record, we found many different types of uh, mostly Eocene birds um, that have various parrot-like features, but how they're actually related to parrots is still kind of unclear. Um, however, um, in recent times, there has been, um, well, actually a whole series of studies, but uh, I, I mentioned this one in particular, um, where they described uh, additional specimens of these birds, um, mostly from, again, the London clay formation, um, <laughs> and um, kind of gave us some additional looks at their um, anatomy. Um, and so uh, they're actually like, like these, these papers actually describe like many different uh, types and specimens of, of like parrot-like birds. Um, but I highlight this particular one here uh, because it belongs to like one of the most um, mysterious groups, I think you could say. So um, you probably don't remember this unless you have a very good memory. Um, but in the episode, I talked about how um, there is a, 
um, a set of Eocene birds that appear to maybe be close relatives, um, but at the time we did not have very strong evidence for that. Um, so, they, but they were proposed to be close relatives and proposed to possibly be closely related to parrots, but again, we weren't really sure about that. Um, and so this group of birds includes um, Vostanavis, which is known from quite a few, quite a, quite a good number of bones from the Eocene of India. Uh, it includes um, Euro Fluvio Viridavis uh, from the Eocene of Germany, so that's another mesel bird. Um, and it, it was it's called such a long name because it was thought to be closely related to another bird from North America called Fluvio Viridavis. Uh, but in the end, <laughs> it was found that it is not closely related to Fluvio Viridavis. So now it has a really misleading and very difficult to read name called Euro Fluvio Viridavis. Um, so yeah. Oh well, we're we're kind of stuck with that. Um, and it also includes a bird from North America called um, Avolatavis, which is only known from like the hip and the, and the hind limb and the, the tail, so like basically the back, back half of the body, basically. Um, and so these birds, uh, their feet look a lot like parrots. Um, and so it was um, it was considered that they might be like uh, you know very closely related to parrots. Um, however, like a lot of recent studies where they, when they've included these birds in phylogenetic analyses, have found that they are uh, actually only distant relatives to parrots at most. Um, now, uh, the authors of this new paper describe a new species of Avalatavis from the London Clay Formation. Now, Avalatavis uh, was previously only known from the North America, so they call it this Avalatavis europaeus, so to mark it as like the, the first European Avalatavis. Um, and uh, in this paper, at least, they do suggest that, yes, Avalatavis was probably a close relative of Vastanavis and um, Eurofluvio Viridavis. And so uh, together, these birds would be called the Vastanavids. Um, and they were able to include uh, the new information that they got into a phylogenetic analysis. Um, and on the next slide, I show you basically results of this phylogenetic analysis. And what they found was that Vastanavids um, were probably not super close to parrots, um, but they were probably still on the lineage kind of leading to both the parrots and the passeriform birds, which are the closest living relatives to parrots today. Um, and so uh, it seems that we have um, gained more understanding into the diversity of the kind of the stem lineage leading to these two, um, which today look very different um, groups. And in addition, uh, you can also see here the placement of two other fossil groups that have been considered at various times close to parrots, and we talked about this in the episode. Uh, so these are the uh, Mesolasturids, uh, which are a group that have these like very strongly hooked beaks um, and might have been like predatory. Um, and then uh, also the Halcyornithids, which are another group um, that have uh, kind of robust but not hooked uh, beaks, uh, more pointed, triangular-looking beaks. Um, and so all these groups have been at various times close, thought to be like maybe like stem lineage parrots, but the recent evidence suggests that um, they are actually equally close to both the parrots and passeriform birds. And if this is the case, then the parrot-like features were actually already present in the common ancestor of parrots and passeriforms. And it's just that parrots kept those similarities, passeriforms mostly did not. So yeah, it's very good to get more insight into these birds. I'll add that uh, some of the other new specimens that they described uh, belong to like new species of Mesolasturids. So we now have some um, new information on their anatomy as well. Um, the same authors also described some new halcyo ornithid specimens from the London clay formation. And so, yeah, we, we're, we're getting a lot of new data on, on these all these different groups of birds, um, and that's really great. So hopefully, we're, with time and further research, gain more insight into exactly how these birds relate um, to uh, modern groups. Uh, but for now, I think um, this particular topology, I'm um, reasonably, I, I think is reasonably plausible. Um, do you have anything to add to this? This is wonderful. Um, I just want to clarify, though. So this is everything that's closer to parrots and passerines than it is to like falcons, right? Exactly. Yes. So, so all of these groups, at least according to the phylogeny that they found, uh, would, would have originally like after the divergence with falcons. Yeah. So falcons would be like the the next most distant group out from this that's not shown on the slide. Yeah. I love it when a branch of the tree of life is fleshed out better. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.
Um, so let's go on to the next slide. And as you might recall from our episode, uh, we spent a lot of time in the episode talking about like studying parrot cognition, um, as well as the cognition of other birds as well, but especially parrots. Um, and so as always, uh, there have been a few uh, studies looking at parrot kind of cognition that come out in the past year. Um, so these are just a few examples. Um, so first of all, on the left here um, are some tools that have been made by parrots. And so these are um, tools that were made by a species a parrot called the palm cockatoo. And so they have a very interesting um, way of tool use. And because the, what they use tools for is that the males will break off branches or seed pods. Um, like they, they will fashion these objects to a certain length that, or, or like shape that they like. And then they will bang the sticks or seed pods against uh, mostly hollow trees or tree branches and then use that as part of their mating display uh, to, to the females. And so they basically put on a drumming kind of performance um, to, to attract females, which is really interesting. Um, and so what the authors of this study did was that they looked at the, the shapes of the tools that were made by these male palm cockatoos. So on the um, left, you can see some sticks that were made um, as drumsticks by the, uh, by the cockatoos. Um, and on the uh, right, you can see various seed pods that they've nibbled into various different shapes. Um, so the takeaway of this study is that um, each individual cockatoo had its own preference for what the shape of its tool should be. Uh, like different cockatoos have different preferences of how long the stick should be or how wide uh, the stick should be. Um, and it seems that uh, these individual preferences they were not getting from other, from observing other individual cockatoos. Um, like they were all independent. They were all making their own independent creative decisions, basically. Um, and indeed, palm cockatoos are very territorial, so it's very unlikely that uh, a male palm cockatoo would stick around long enough in another male's territory to see how it was fashioning its drumsticks. Um, and so um, this is a pretty interesting uh, study showing that like there's there's a lot of individuality in the preferences um, of palm cockatoos uh, when it comes to making uh, these uh, these drumsticks um, and and like it's not like these cockatoos um, were had access to like different resources and that's why the shapes were different like no in, in many cases like they, they were all found in the same region so in theory uh, they had access to this all the same branches and such but still like you would see these individual differences arise um, so yeah pretty cool they're they're very individualistic musicians I guess um, as, as for the figure on the um, on the right here, there was yet another study coming out of uh, researchers studying um, a species called the Tannenbar Corella, also called the Goffin's Cockadoo. We have talked a lot about the Tannenbar Bar Corella in, in a, like not just the episode, but um, also our updates um, specials uh, for the series, uh, because it is one of the main, um, main parrot species that have been studied uh, regarding tool use, because we know that Tannenbar Corellas are capable of all kinds of remarkable uh, means of tool use, like not not only like um, using tools, but also like making different tools for different purposes or understanding what uh, different tools are for and also um, what sequence to use different tools in, like all, all that jazz. Like, like uh, there have been all kinds of studies done on tan and corellas uh, when it comes to how they use tools and um, how they understand tool use. And so this is a new study investigating another kind of aspect of this uh, behavior. And so what they did was that uh, first, the Tannenbar gorillas uh, used in the study um, were given these puzzle boxes and uh, with food inside, of course. Um, and these boxes, to get to the food, uh, they had to use two different types of tools. One was a short sh pointed stick. Um, and so they had to use the pointed stick to poke a hole in like this membrane that was covering the box. And after they poked a hole in it, um, they had to take a different stick, um, which was longer but more flexible. And so it, it, it was too flexible to actually poke a hole in the membrane, uh, but it was long enough to reach the food that was inside the box and kind of you, you can use it to like push the food and, uh, and fish it out, basically. Um, the parrots had to figure out that they had to use both of these tools in this particular sequence to get to the food in these boxes. So, okay, so they, they showed the parrots the, the, the setup, and several of them were able to pass the test. They were able to figure out the puzzle. Um, okay, so then they did uh, a follow-up to this. And so they, they used the different setups that you see in the photographs here. So on top um, is that they presented the parrots with these two different tools on a table. And then the parrot would have to climb up a ladder and then get to the puzzle box. Um, in the in the setup in B, the parrot uh, had to uh, pick up the tools from the table and then fly to the puzzle box. 
And then in C, uh, they had to pick up the tools once again, but this time they had to fly, and uh, not just fly in a horizontal line, but like fly vertically upward um, into the puzzle box. So this last one, they had to put like more effort uh, compared to the other two um, to get the tools up there, essentially. And what the researchers wanted to find out was that do the parrots have an understanding of a tool set? Like, depending on the box that they were, they were given, because some of these boxes, they had to use both tools, and others, they only had to use one tool to finish the job. And so, do the parrots understand um, that uh, they had to like carry um, two different tools for a specific type of task? And it turns out that, yeah, at least some of the individual parrots, um, when they were um, faced with the puzzle box that required both tools, would pretty much almost always bring both of the tools with them once they had figured out how to do so. Um, whereas if they were shown the box where only one tool was required, they would sometimes bring both tools, but not always. And so, uh, yeah, they, they, they definitely seem to show an understanding of like when they would need both tools. And as for the reason for why uh, they would sometimes carry both tools with them, uh, even when it, one tool was needed. Well, it's possible that um, making a mistake would have caused them to cause them to spend more energy than bringing both tools. Um, so like, yeah, like carrying both tools is heavier than carrying one tool, sure. Uh, but if you went up to a box and it turns out that you needed two tools, then you have to go back and then bring the other tool, and that's even more work. So that, that's one possible reason why why they would carry two tools to like the single use box. Um, uh, another one is that it turns out that these two particular tools, um, some of the parrots figured out that there was a pretty easy way of carrying them both at the same time. So like the, uh, the longer um, stick, I think, was like a tube like structure. Um, and so they would insert like one end of like the shorter um, stick into the tube and then like just, just grab both of those with the beak um, and then just carry them together. And so I was like, oh, it's a, it's a pretty handy way of carrying both tools. Might as well carry both tools. Um, so it seems that um, cannonball gorillas can indeed develop the concept of a tool set and also know when to use that tool set. So that's pretty cool. Um, do you have anything to add to this? I will admit, like regarding your first uh, paper here on the cockatoos, um, I think the description of them as like drumming behaviors is a lot more generous than what I was going through in my head. <laughs> I'm just like all these male cockatoos. Hey, babe, I'm a rebel, and proceeds to vandalize a tree. <laughs> oh no, no! Like they, they are, they are using the, they are using the sticks as like actual instruments to, to like, uh, to like make, make sounds. Like it's, a, it's a sounds that, that are really attracting the, the, the females, and not, not the, not the fact that they're breaking sticks off, off trees. <laughs> yeah. Right. right. It's neat though. It's like it's an understanding of like the creation of music, but without you know necessarily using like the vocal track. In right, earth. exactly. <laughs> yeah, super, super interesting. Then we go to our uh, next study. Uh, this is a quite an interesting one. So we haven't gotten away from bird cognition just yet. Um, so we talked in our episodes about how yeah the parrots are really smart and some of the songbirds are really smart like the corvids for example but there hasn't been much research on whether they're closest like the, the closest living relatives of both of these groups like the falcons like are falcons smart that's hard to say right um so uh, a new study uh, decided to uh, look at just that and what they did was they they showed these puzzle boxes um, to a particular species of uh, uh, falcon um, in the wild called the striated caracara. This particular species of falcon anecdotally has been reported to be like a very curious and intelligent um, animal. Um, and they live on the Falkland Islands where there are like, there, there are essentially no larger predators. Um, and so they're, they're not very afraid of new things. Um, and so whenever people show up, they'll come over and like interact with you and they'll check, th check new things out. And they're very good at figuring out ways of getting food. Uh, in fact, I think there was a book that came out recently called A Most Remarkable Creature, which is all about like the author's experiences with, with the species of bird. Um, I haven't read it yet, but I, I've heard good things. Um, in any case, despite this, there, there hasn't been a lot of like controlled, rigorous study about um, like the cognitive abilities of these striated caracaras. Um, and so the researchers of a new study decided to show them uh, these puzzle boxes, uh, kind of very similar to the puzzle boxes that have been used with parrots um, in uh, parrot research. And so these puzzle boxes have like multiple different compartments. And in each compartment, like a bit of food will be put inside. And you had to figure out different ways of like getting to the food for each of these different compartments. And it's described on, on the slide here, but it's like, so like there, there's one, there's one compartment where like, 
like you had to ride a little plank to get the food to fall off. Um, there's one where you had to push the food uh, off a pedal pedestal with a with a lever, basically. Um, there's one where you had to tip like a little seesaw down so that the re the reward tumbles down. Um, there's one you had to pull a wire to to open the window. Um, one you have to like poke a hole in the paper window, and then there's there's one where you uh, flip a cup over and the the fluid is underneath there. Um, there's one where you remove a stick and the and the food will fall down, uh, and there's one where you have to like slide a door open. And well, the uh, Karakaras they perform like with flying colors, basically, like pretty much all the Karakaras that they that they observed interacting with the puzzle box figured out how to solve all the puzzles in this box and um, add a comparable speed to um, what like Cannonball Corellas have been observed doing. And yeah, we just talked about how smart Cannonball Corellas are. Um, and what's more is that in some of the puzzles, um, some of the more difficult puzzles in this puzzle box, um, like less than 50% of Cannonball Corellas in previous studies um, were able to figure out, or at least within the, the amount of time that they were given. But again, like almost all striated Caracaras uh, that interacted with this box figured out almost all the puzzles. Um, so yeah, like evidently like striated Caracaras has some really um, kind of well-developed um, problem-solving capabilities. And so uh, the author suggests that, yeah, like striated Caracaras should perhaps um, would be a very useful uh, like new model for studying avian intelligence. And I, I, I can't wait to see like what new research tells us about the uh, cognitive ab abilities of striated Caracaras. Um, so it may be that like the parrots, songbirds, and the falcons, um, like this entire trio of, of like closely related birds that are all very different from each other, but they, they all kind of share at least the potential for being like um, like real avian geniuses, I guess you could say. Um, so yeah, like th this was this was a really cool find. Um, how about how about you? What do you think? <laughs> it's amazing. Um, I was going to echo off what you said too, like like this big trio. Um, <laughs> has like members of like high cognition that really are opening the doors for this sort of research until we look at Siri Amos and then we realize like <laughs> there's some hidden intelligence in there too that we haven't considered before. Right. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I really wonder. I really wonder. But anyways, uh, let's go on to the next slide. And we, we are very close to the end here because we are in the last episode now. Uh, this is the sound of a new dawn where we talked about the passeriform birds, which are over half of all living birds, but, you know, uh, lems of breaks. Um, so first of all, uh, from the paleontological um, side of things, uh, we have a new species of stem passeriform called Sora avis. And this one is from, it again, the London Clay Formation. Um, and... Um, this is a new stem passeriform um, that has uh, a number of notable things about it. Uh, it it's not known from a, uh, a bad specimen. You can see that like, quite a few bones are known from it, uh, both bones from the hind limbs and the forelimbs, and a little bit from the beak even. Um, and uh, one of its most notable features is that its uh, feet, its foot bones, uh, as noted on the bottom row um, down there, like the, the really elongated bones um, in the bottom center, uh, they seem to be, have been very long and slender, especially when you view them from the side. Um, and so feet like these are often found in birds that uh, kind of forage by kind of dangling upside down um, from, a, from a branch or something. And so in, in this position, they can uh, check out the underside of a tree branch or the underside of a leaf, or like they can reach uh, another uh, branch or a leaf next to them and get to something really hard to reach. Um, so they can, kind of have this dangling foraging behavior. And so um, the author suggests that maybe Sora Avis was doing something like that, uh, which is cool. Um, and the other thing is that, so this is um, one of those stem passeriforms that have feet that in some ways are more like parrots. So they have zygodactyl uh, feet um, where uh, two of the toes point backwards. In modern passeriforms, only one of the toes points backwards. Um, but it seems that uh, the kind of ancestral lineage leading on to, leading up to passerines um, kind of went through a phase where it still had like these zygodactyl parrot-like feet and the Sora avis was one of them. And in the phylogenetic analysis that the authors ran, um, which I picture kind of a, a, a summary of on the, on the next slide, um, and they found that uh, Sora avis and a few other kind of Eocene birds form a distinct group of stem passeriforms that they call the Morsora avids. Um, and we, we talked about some members of this group in the uh, in the episode, actually. So there's a there's a form called a Pumiliornis from the Eocene of Germany, which is actually the earliest uh, uh, bird uh, 
preserved with evidence of feeding on nectar because there's pollen preserved in the gut of some specimens. Um, and there's also a bird called a Morsor avis uh, from the Eocene of Denmark um, that seems to be similar to Sora avis. And so these these three birds uh, form a group that the authors called the Morsor avids. Um, now, in the when we did the episode, when, when we did the original episode, um, Morsor avis and Pumiliornis were thought to be members of a different uh, stem passerine group called the Satacopedids, which is also pictured on the slide here. Um, but yeah, th this new study with the new information from Sora Avis suggests that they uh, that they, they may be a, like an independent group that's separate from the Cetacopedids. And so now we have these three different groups of like uh, stem group passeriforms with zygodactyl feet, the Cetacopedids, Morsoravids, and zygodactylids. So it seems that um, passeriform uh, stem lineage diversity was uh, quite remarkable in the in the um, uh, paleogene. Um, so uh, yeah, do you have anything to add to this before we move on? clarify um this tree here this is everything now more closely related to passerines than to parrots right exactly yes uh, so yeah parrots would be like the next group that's not shown on on this slide the next group out basically excellent well really we're really fleshing out this this part mm -hmm. of the bird tree yeah <laughs> yeah it's really amazing how much we, we found out about like this particular part of the the bird tree uh, the, uh, a lot of like fossil insights uh which is really cool <laughs> um so Next, uh, we're, we're going to delve a little bit back into uh, bird cognition, um, but uh, because the, this study was specifically on songbirds, so I put it in this section instead. Um, so basically, um, we mentioned in the episode that songbirds, uh, as well as parrots too, are notable for being vocal learners. And in this way, they are like us, right? Like we can we can hear a sound and then and then figure out how to make that sound ourselves. Basically, um, it has been you know observed that you know a lot of these really smart birds, like the parrots and the corvids, are all vocal learners. So uh, does vocal learning actually correlate with uh, kind of problem solving capabilities? Um, so that's what this study decided to find out. And so they looked at songbirds, um, just songbirds. Um, so not, they didn't include like parrots or falcons in this, but just songbirds. Um, they specifically compared uh, songbirds um, where they exhibit what is called a uh, um, open vocal learning. So basically, these, these species can learn new sounds all throughout their life, um, uh, which is kind of like us, I guess. Um, whereas uh, some other songbirds are closed vocal learners. So when they're young, they go through a period of time when they can learn uh, new uh, sounds. But after after they are of a certain age, they, they stop um, having this ability, basically. Um, so the songbirds that uh, have open vocal learning um, are considered to have more complex vocal learning. At, um, at, at least that's what this uh, title is referring to here. Um, and so they compared like the problem solving capabilities of these two different types of vocal learners within songbirds. Um, and what they found was that, uh, yes, indeed, um, the um, songbirds that are open vocal learners that can learn songs throughout their life um, are more are, are better at problem solving. They were more likely to succeed at uh, problem solving compared to um, closed vocal learners. And the way they tested this was they gave they gave like um, uh, different types of songbirds, like these various different types of containers with food in them, and they had to figure out the way to get to the food, like either by like opening a lid or like poking a hole or so on and so forth. Um, and uh, yeah, it turns out the success rate was higher in uh, songbirds that had more complex vocal learning. And not only that, but they were also able to show that um, songbirds with more complex vocal learning also had bigger brains than ones that didn't. And furthermore, they also had like more um, a greater like repertoire of sounds that they, they were able to make. Um, and so having more complex vocal learning, it seems, does correlate with um, higher cognition, at least in songbirds. Um, so yeah, that was a really interesting uh, study um, that kind of confirms a suspicion that I think many people have had. Um, do you have anything to add? That's very interesting. Um, I'm very curious like what this would imply then for other behaviors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, it, it is quite curious, isn't it? So um, the authors actually did test some other things uh, in the study beyond like problem solving. Um, so like they, they also tested, for example, um, things like um, how quickly uh, birds could uh, learn certain things, certain concepts, for example, like how quickly they could learn to associate like uh, two different colors with each other or, or things like that. Um, and it turns out in some of those other tests, in like, or indeed in, in pretty much all the other tests besides problem solving, there is no clear correlation between the complexity of vocal learning um, and like those other abilities. And so clearly, like, vocal learning does not correlate with 
improvements in all kinds of cognition, uh, but it does correlate with specifically with problem solving. So it's definitely a really interesting relationship that they found here. Um, and yeah, I, I definitely would like to see this also done with like parrots, for example. Like, um, like I wonder if they could they could find like a similar trend there. <laughs> so uh, let's go on to the next slide. The final episode of Dinosaurs, the second chapter. Um, we, in addition to covering passeriform diversity and evolution, we also discussed some of the major uh, threats that birds face today, uh, primarily as a re result of human activities. And of course, um, that is a problem that has not really gone away. And so there have been several new noteworthy studies um, on this subject. Uh, of course, like this is a huge, huge topic that a lot of people are working on it. So uh, of course, I can only pick out a few like representative studies that caught my eye over the past year. But obviously, like a huge amount of research is being done on bird conservation. But uh, yeah, let's see. First of all, um, on the left here is a is a figure is a chart um, from a, um, a study looking at the causes of decline in birds specifically in Europe. So they, they looked at basically population trends in many different European bird species um, uh, across like several decades. And then kind of try to correlate that with various major human caused changes in the environment. So for example, um, the increase in the amount of uh, farm cover, so like agricultural practices, um, or changes in forest cover, like people either planting trees or cutting them down, um, or changes in uh, urbanization, the, the uh, kind of spread and uh, increase in size of cities. Um, and also, of course, climate change, like changes in, in the overall uh, average temperatures over time. Um, and so uh, what they found here um, is that, so they've color coded each of these different um, phenomena, I guess, uh, on the on the graph here. And on the left, it, it basically shows the effect of these phenomena on um, bird trends. Like how do they correlate with uh, the trends with in, uh, in bird populations um, and how strong these effects actually are. So um, the important thing to look at here is that for, for each um, human-made activity, um, they map up the correlation of the trend in the activity. So the bottom, the bottom um, kind of bar in each of these comparisons um, with the trends in bird populations. So like, how does the trend in farm cover correlate with the trend in bird populations? Um, and so what they found was that mo most of these uh, activities had a negative effect on uh, bird populations. Uh, and so they're, they're all concentrated on the negative side of the, the chart here. Um, so uh, farm cover, um, urbanization and temperature trends all had a negative kind of effect on bird populations, which is not a huge surprise, unfortunately. Um, whereas the like, trends in forest cover did not have a major effect, like whether positive or negative on overall uh, bird uh, populations. Um, and out of the uh, three negative effects, the one that had by far the biggest effect was the change in farm cover, uh, shortly followed by like the trend in urbanization. And so at least in Europe, within this time frame, it seems like bird population dynamics were most negatively affected by agricultural practices, more so than changes in climate even. Um, which is, well, <laughs> quite an alarming, but um, quite an important find. Um, and why, why, why does agriculture influence bird populations so much? Um, well, probably the main reason is the use of pesticides and fertilizers um, that uh, kill off like a lot of the uh, invertebrates that birds feed on. Of course, like some birds primarily eat insects and almost nothing else. Um, and other birds, like even if they all eat other things, still depend on insects to feed their young, especially because insects are a great source of protein. And so probably a lot of birds are being affected by the use of pesticides and such. And of course, there's also the fact that pesticides can directly kill birds too, if the, the too much of it accumulates in their systems. Um, and so... Yeah, it seems that this is likely a reason for one of the major causes of decline in European birds uh, is agriculture, uh, shortly followed by urbanization. On the right here uh, is a, are some bar charts showing uh, basically how different species of birds are affected by these different activities. So not all of these activities affect different species in the same ways. Uh, some birds actually benefit from the from the changes that we've been making to the environment. And so, so you can see some of them actually fall on the positive end of the graph, uh, but many others fall on the negative end of the graph for many of these um, activities. And of course, it should be emphasized that it just because there are species benefiting from these um, activities doesn't mean that's a good thing overall, right? Uh, because like the, the fact that some species are benefiting from from these activities um, is still like shifting ecological dynamics in a way that um, was 
very different from what the what the um, actual ecosystems were like um, like not not long ago um we're, we're still losing like ecological niches or uh, particular species that are uh, important uh, both to humans and to ecosystems in ways that we, we cannot easily get back just by increasing the abundance of other species um so yeah like uh this is a this is a really Quite a, quite an impressive and large scale study um, looking at what what the major threats are to birds at least in Europe. Um, in the middle here um, was a study looking at um, kind of calculating uh, what what is called the edge score of birds. Um, so I, I think we probably talked about this on the show before. Um, so one of the ways in which um, uh, conservation uh, organizations have tried to decide um, what are the main species of organisms to uh, prioritize conserving um, is by what is called evolutionary distinctiveness. So basically, does a species have a lot of close relatives like alive today, or is it like a, sitting on a long branch um, where most of the other most of its close relatives have already gone extinct? Basically, um, the idea is that. Uh, if we conserve like these evolutionarily distinct groups, we are more likely to kind of capture a kind of a unique um, species or species that are playing unique roles in their ecosystems and of course are, are of unique scientific interest and such. Um, so I think the edge score uh, stands for like evolutionarily distinct and globally endangered. And so it basically combines like how evolutionarily distinct certain organisms are, like each species of organism is, with like how much risk they are at of going extinct and then these two things combined gives gives them an edge score and that tells um or at least uh, gives conservation organizations an idea of like which species are like most important to to conserve uh, or these should be prioritized uh, when it comes to conserving them and so uh, the edge scores of birds have been calculated before uh, but uh, basically um, there have been new methods like developed in the meantime to kind of calculate edge scores in a way that better reflects like both evolutionary history and like the current status of, of these organisms and so um, the, the authors of this new study basically recalculated edge scores for like all the birds of the world um, and furthermore they kind of zeroed in on three particular categories of birds that are especially threatened so these are the parrots um, the raptors or birds of prey so that includes like hawks and eagles as well as owls falcons and seriamas um and as, as well as seabirds which uh, includes like basically like all types of marine birds like coming coming from a variety of different like distantly related groups um and so what the chart is showing here is that um in general like overall raptors and seabirds are more evolutionarily distinct compared to like other types of birds um whereas parrots as a group um, are like kind of below average when it comes to evolutionary distinctiveness. Um, but that that's not a huge surprise because all the parrots are like one group, right? And they're, they're thought to be like a relatively recent um, group uh, when it comes to like major groups of birds that people classify as, I guess, orders and such. Um, so that it, it's not a completely fair comparison because uh, the birds of prey and the seabirds act, are actually like multiple different major groups of birds together. Um, so of course, like the, it, it makes sense that you would get a higher like evolutionary uh, distinctiveness out of those. Um, probably more importantly um, is that um, the amount of evolutionary distinctiveness that is at immediate risk of extinction in all three is above the the risk that is being faced by other types of birds, and so. Um, this basically confirms that, yes, these three groups will be very important for us to prioritize conserving. Hopefully, we can uh, make further strides towards doing so. Um, and finally, um, the, the rightmost chart here um, is another um, study that looked at evolutionary distinctiveness of birds, but also um, uh, kind of in relation to um, their use to people basically uh, so obviously people use birds for food um, or uh, they use parts of birds as medicines or to use them as material like think of um, eider down that we put our put in our jackets and such um, or and of course people keep birds as pets um, and so birds have a lot of like uh, direct utility to to humans um, and so this study wanted to look at are um, evolutionarily distinctive species um, actually you know likely to to be useful to humans essentially um, they, they found that uh, indeed uh, in blue here in the, the lighter blue um, oftentimes birds that were being used were evolutionarily distinct uh, species um, 
But in addition to evolutionary distinctiveness, there is also functional distinctiveness. In terms of function, how, how distinct a bird is from other birds, like is it shaped in a different way from other birds, for example? Does it, does it do things differently from what other birds do in terms of its behavior or its ecology? Um, it turns out that um, birds that are useful to humans um, also tend to be functionally distinct. But what's especially interesting is that these two groups often didn't overlap. Um, so for example, there are very few bird species that are both functionally distinct and evolutionary distinct um, that are used by humans for food. Uh, so the, the overlap is kind of the, the dark the dark bar down there, um, whereas functional distinctiveness is the, the, the orange uh, bar. Um, so basically authors say that the take-home point is that if we want to conserve birds that are useful to humans, uh, it is important to conserve both evolutionarily distinct birds and functionally distinct ones. Um, and of course, I, I did mention in the, in the original episode that, yeah, I think um, we shouldn't care about organisms just because they're useful to people, right? Like, I think that's a, that's a very myopic way of, of doing things. But it can't be denied that if an animal or, or any other organism is useful to people, um, that certainly gives people greater motivation to protect it. Um, and so obviously, I, I do think it is important for us to identify um, how humans are actually using uh, many of these species and what is lost if we uh, you know, do not um, conserve them. So yeah, uh, just a few studies on bird conservation that I thought are worth sharing um, on in the series. Um, do you have anything to add to this before we close off? I say I think it's good that we're getting more studies like this that are taking a very holistic approach to bird conservation, and are really trying to get like down into the numbers of about what the situation is like and how we can move forward from there. So it's very good to see this sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I honestly have not looked at edge in a long time i know they had a website yeah. that they frequently update and they had like their top 100 edge species that that's right like, yes um, so i'm curious if they've updated that in recent times like in light of all of this new sort of research right um, which you reminded me of this actually i kind of wanted to look at that at some point. <laughs> yeah in fact um well, last I checked, which hasn't been in a while, I'll admit, but but I think they they in fact have released like the updated um, list of mammals, for example. So uh, yeah, I have one more slide before we actually finish. Um, and so of course, as you as you probably know, um, if you've been following this series for a while, um, at the end of these updates, uh, I, I always like to emphasize, or at least I, I always like to show a, a list of the newly named uh, bird species um, that have uh, been named since we last did an update of the series. And as you can see here um we've had quite a lot in the past year <laughs> um not as many living bird species this year but quite a lot of fossil ones uh you might recognize some of them from you know the, the stories that we just covered um so definitely quite a lot of noteworthy finds in the world of bird paleontology and uh, i don't think we're going to be slowing down anytime soon if you don't have anything to add to this um shall we head to our closing matter i'm glad that we've had a pretty good year for crown bird fossils and, and, and paleontology and uh, goodness knows what the next year is going to bring for us, huh? Absolutely. I look forward to making the next update special. <laughs> uh, so yeah, until next time, uh, that's been this update of Dinosaur's second chapter. Uh, hopefully you all enjoyed that um, or learned something new. Um, if you liked this episode uh, or, or the series, uh, you can Please consider supporting us on Patreon, uh, because uh, any amount of support that you give will help us uh, make this series even better and help us uh, produce uh, episodes. At the moment, we have, I believe, six patrons um, who are uh, at a tier where we need to give them shoutouts in each episode. And so these would be uh, Joan's sister, Julie, um, as well as uh, our friends Paul, Denver, Frankish, Tristan, and Val de Nunzio. Um, and so thank you all very much for your support. Uh, I'll mention, uh, as we often do, that uh, we do release kind of uh, episode previews and other exclusive content for our high-level patrons. And so uh, do consider checking those out if that's something you'd be interested in. Um, as for uh, special thanks, uh, as always, uh, the theme music for our, our podcast, Through Time and Clades, was made by our friend Henry, uh, whereas the color scheme for my Alvaris or Avatar, as pictured here, was created by my friend Alicia. And so uh, they always have uh, critical contributions to every episode. Uh, if 
you uh, would like to stay up to date with our show, um, we are on YouTube, uh, which is where you're probably listening to us right now. And so uh, if you haven't subscribed yet, feel free to do so. <laughs> and then you'll be notified whenever uh, we release new episodes. Um, but in addition to YouTube, you can also follow us on uh, Twitter, uh, which is now called X, but no one calls, calls it that. Um, uh, we will continue staying on that ship until it sinks for real. But yes, we, we are still on Twitter um, at Through Time and Clades, uh, where we release announcements whenever we um, release new episodes. So, uh, yep, you can feel free to follow us on there if you are also um, still <laughs> stubborn enough not to let go of the, that hellscape. Uh, you can also contact us by our email address, timeandclades at gmail.com. Um, if you have any questions about uh, the things we've covered in this episode or in other episodes, uh, we are uh, always very happy to answer uh, viewer queries. Um, and finally, um, all the papers I discussed in this episode, um, I will link to them in the description below. If you want to find out more about these findings or read these papers for yourself, uh, that's where you can go. So uh, yeah, thank you so much for sticking with us, everybody. Um, this is probably going to be our last episode of the year uh, because the holidays are coming up soon and we probably will have other things to do um, besides uh, recording. So uh, we'll most likely see you next uh, in the new year. Uh, but before we finish off for real, I believe, Joan, you have a special announcement to make. You're right, Albert. Um, so this has been kind of a long time coming, but I'm, and I've had like thoughts about whether to go this route or not. But I can finally say that we have some concrete plans in order. So um, from here on out, I will not be continuing uh, update specials for Humanity of Prologue in the traditional sense because I'm going to be devoting my efforts to a brand new season of Humanity of Prologue. So this is going to be more focused towards cultural evolution and how culture manifests itself in human societies around the world and throughout time. And so there is going to naturally be some retread. You know, we're going to kind of bring up to speed what's the situation with paleoanthropology and human origins, as well as many questions about, you know, where technologies and language and um, family systems and societies originated and how. And so each episode is going to explore a different topic that covers sort of sociocultural issues and, and evolution in a human context. And so I'm looking forward to working on this series. There's going to be a lot of ground to cover. Um, and tentatively, we're looking for perhaps an early 2024 release date, at least for the first episode. Um, but of course, we'll have more concrete details as you know, the new year rolls around. Um, but I'm definitely looking forward to sharing this with everyone. And uh, it's going to be nice to kind of jump back into sort of more of a lecture series again um, for, for Through Time and Clay. I'm really looking forward to it. And uh, mm -hmm. I hope you are too, buddy. Yeah, I, I definitely am. This looks really exciting. I, I'm really excited to see what you come up with. But um, the format that you have already kind of given us here, I, I, I really like. I'm definitely looking forward um, to this new development uh, of our show. Um, and I hope everybody else listening is too. <laughs> Absolutely. And of course, we thank you all so much for joining us today. And we hope you learn something new as always with us. And we look forward to seeing you again in our next adventures in the new year. <laughs> we hope you all stay safe and enjoy your time with your family and loved ones, whatever. Exactly. <laughs> Take care, everybody. Have a good one.